How's that for a slice of fried gold? Are you think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. I'll be mad. Just a flesh wound. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Take your sticky paws off me, you damn dirty ape. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I guess everyone's a time of luck scared. Well, hello, and welcome to the Cinema Shock, the podcast where we take deep dives into the story. Said the Cinema Shock. Oh, did I really? I didn't even mean to that time. I didn't even mean to. Damn it. I was about to t- comment on how perfectly and smoothly this intro was going to be as as opposed to every other episode, <laughs> but I still fucked it up. Oh, man. I Justin wrote it out wrote for you. <laughs> Justin wrote down what I needed to say here, and I still fucked it up. Uh, welcome to... Well, hello, and welcome to Cinema Shock, the podcast where we take deep dives into the stories behind your favorite cult and genre films. I'm your co-host, Gary Horn. Hey, I'm co-host Justin Bishop. And uh, good job, Gary. That was thank you so perfect. much. Perfect. That the second part of that was perfect. Oh, well, I appreciate it. <laughs> and we are, man, I Gary, I'm so excited about our guest today. We've been trying to get this guy on for a long time. <laughs> I'm fucking sick of this guy. <laughs> we are uh, we're joined today by writer and comedian and chainsaw salesman did you know this about this guy uh, mr todd a davis welcome well, to the show todd thank you listen they are only for juggling <laughs> strictly for juggling and all these and people we, are like oh i want to trim these branches i'm like you psycho yeah you know, who does doing? that whatever what <laughs> so uh this is a, a brand new series this week is beginning this is going to be a multi-part series i don't even know how many parts i haven't counted and uh and this is going to be a series i don't know i think we're doing five or six episodes this first go around then I mean, we're going to we literally uh, looked at it right before this but that sounds right sure i don't <laughs> i didn't i didn't count i wasn't paying, but five or six i don't know but then uh in the future we're going to continue the series and we we have our reasons for wanting to break it up that way. So, uh, you know, just trust us, I guess. When but you this have your series. own movie podcast, you can break it up however you want. But you're, That's listening, true. you're listening to the Cinema Shockers. <laughs> so. uh, but yeah, we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about a guy named Toby Hooper. Uh, so if you know that name, if you've heard the name Toby Hooper, if, if uh, that name means anything to you at all. He was Venom in the Spider-Man movies. <laughs> no, he's the Scranton Strangler, dummy. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> when I say the name Toby Hooper, a couple things might come to your mind. The first is probably the image of Leatherface, which is the monster at the center of Hooper's 1974 breakout film, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The other thing that you might think of is the persistent rumor that Hooper actually did not direct the film that was his most financially successful film, 1982's Poltergeist. And the, the, Hooper's career is interesting because just like we, we talk about the masters of horror, we've talked, we, we did a whole series on one of them. Well, I'm sure we'll hit the rest of them down the line, but just like other masters of horrors, you know, guys like Wes Craven, George Romero, John Carpenter, not every movie that Hooper directed was great. Some of his films, especially some of the stuff later in his career, are, are very bad. They're nearly unwatchable. There are, there are a handful that are nearly unwatchable. But unlike Craven, Hooper didn't create multiple successful franchises. He didn't have a string of like just bona fide classics like someone like John Carpenter did. And he didn't have the distinction of creating an entirely new subgenre like Romero but I think that Hooper's story is still one that's worth telling, if only to showcase how willing Hollywood is to simply discard an artist who has a true vision if that vision doesn't fit their standards of success. So we're calling this series The Tragedy of Toby Hooper. Shout out to Gary for that title, by the way. Good job, Gary. Oh, thanks. Very nice. <laughs> uh, but we're calling it The Tragedy of Toby Hooper because that's what his career ultimately was. It was a tragedy. It was... Uh, This is a guy who began his career with a film that would literally forever change the face of cinema, 
but he ended his career doing direct to video direct. His final film was filmed in like Dubai or somewhere where it was the only place he could get financing. He he was completely discarded by the Hollywood machine. Wow. So in order to tell his story, we've got to go back to the beginning to the film that put Hooper on the map. That film, of course, is 1974's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What happened was true. The most bizarre and brutal series of crimes in America. Sally, I hear something. Stop! Stop! This is the movie that is just as real. Just as close. Just as terrifying as being there. But even if one of them survives, what will be left? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. Before we uh, begin, I want to issue a couple of apologies. Um, one of the apologies I'd like to issue is that I understand that venom in the spider-man movies is played by topher grace and <laughs> i could have gone with a joke that toby mcguire uh was spider-man so i could have said he's played spider-man you were doing but you i were doing, you were doing we understand where your heart movie. was gary you're yeah, wrong but you i understand where you're i could was. not have fucked this up more and i'm so sorry oh you could <laughs> <laughs> so and, they, and there's still a lot of time for you to fuck this up so that's true we're just getting started the other apology uh, i want to issue is that we know a lot of you have seen the texas chainsaw massacre and there is a lot of shit about the texas chainsaw massacre and there is no way there is no way possible that we will hit every piece of information no god damn it about. we're gonna try <laughs> we're gonna try <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna cut a path through this but i'm just saying it's uh we'll probably miss something somewhere so forgive us ahead of time there's a lot of shit about this movie well yeah and, and also you have to remember that a lot of the information we're getting are memories of people who were involved in the in the production of the movie and that movie was made nearly half a century ago so some there there is contradicting information depending on who you talk to if you ask uh, Toby Hooper about one particular aspect of production, then you ask Kim Hinkle or or Gunnar Hansen or whoever else about it, you might get different versions of the story because that's just how memory works. Uh, I will say before we get into it, though, that we have, I, I should acknowledge where we got a lot of this information. Uh, you, obviously, we, me and Gary, we both read a lot of various interviews and, and whatnot, but a very important part in this particular episode uh, was an article written by John Bloom, AKA Joe Bob Briggs in Texas monthly called they came, they saw it was a, it's a very long, very uh, in, in depth article that he wrote about the film back in 2004. It also appeared in an earlier form in his book, profoundly disturbing in 2003, which is a great book. If you love cult movies, I highly recommend it. Uh, then there's also a book that I picked up called eaten alive at the chainsaw massacre by John Kenneth Muir. And that's a it's a it's a career overview of Toby Hooper's entire filmography, basically. Uh, so those were both very invaluable. So a lot of this information came from those. So I just want to give credit where credit's due, you know. So it makes William, perfect sense because a lot of these guys uh, paved the way for us. Shout yeah, out absolutely. Joe Bob. Yeah, Joe Bob is basically the only, the reason we're here. <laughs> you know, like he is he was doing this shit that you know giving background on movies uh, when we were in diapers. So. So William Toby Hooper was almost literally born at the movies. Uh, one night in January of 1943, his mother went into labor while sitting in the Paramount Theater in Austin, Texas. Man, I tried to find out what movie they were watching. I could not find that information anymore. Oh, that would have been fun to know. Yeah, <laughs> I really wanted to know what movie <laughs> they must were watching. Have, you must have been able to narrow it down based on the time frame, though, right? I didn't try that hard. Oh. <laughs> and also in the 40s, I mean, in the 40s, like distribution wasn't like it is today. So something True. playing in Austin wouldn't necessarily be the same thing playing in other parts of the country. So who right. the fuck knows? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> his father, uh, who's the owner of a hotel in town, and also I found out owned several movie theaters. Uh, he, he was a movie lover. And he would often head to afternoon matinees. He'd, you know, play hooky from work because he was the boss and could. 
and he would take his wife and young son to the movies with him. And according to Toby Hooper, he saw a movie pretty much every day of his young life, learning cinematic language, essentially before he could actually learn to speak. Like he just absorbed movies. And like many other filmmakers of his generation, he got his start in filmmaking by using an eight millimeter camera that was owned by his father. I mean, we've heard this story how many times before, you know, this is this, the movie brats, the, the Spielbergs, the De Palmas, the Scorsese's, like they all kind of have a very similar background and uh, many of which come from very similar families, uh, you know, at uh, Romero or not, sorry, not Romero Spielberg famously comes from a, a family of, uh, he's a child of divorce uh, something that influenced a lot of his films. The same thing could be said about Toby Hooper. Toby Hooper, uh, you know, he's making movies when he's a kid. He picks up that camera for the first time when he's when he's three, but he really dives into it later in his childhood when he was like eight or nine. And this is right after his parents got divorced when he was eight years old. And mm -hmm. that had a huge impact on him. And he kind of lost himself in making these little movies with his friends. And he also kind of lost himself in one of the very things that influenced George Romero, which are EC comics, you know, Tales nice. from the Crypt, The Vault of Horror, things like that. Like Toby Hooper loved that shit. I would kill, not literally given the subject matter we're discussing today, but uh, <laughs> to have this kind of revelation so early on, because as I sit here sipping my beer and talking about other people with real vision, I wish some something would have clicked in me at three years old. Uh, and then, yeah, you know, with Hoover, like starting almost immediately, the guy was literally making little movies. And by seventh grade, I saw he was doing like class projects using films and uh, he was already even being innovative. There's a story about him being, uh, you know, in a science class during seventh grade, like making a, uh, a movie inspired by Hammer's The Curse of Frankenstein. And yeah. being so in love with the color of the film, he figured out how to make a vignette style movie uh, looking the same way, using all the students, which is just insanity to me. But but then he also talks about being at lunch and hearing the other kids talk about the movies and just really deciding then, like, that's what I needed to do. Yeah. And by like 17, his and support of parents also is nice. Uh, he had a budget of $700 at 17 donated by his father, and he made his first like 16 millimeter film called The Abyss. And it was only yeah, like a little short film. You know, it was only like 30 minutes, 20 people saw it, but he talks about it. Like just the moment it was completed, like having sound music, the whole thing, it felt like he had a huge breakthrough. Like, okay, I can do this. Yeah. I can be a movie director. Oh yeah. I yeah, mean, this later remade so by uh, James Cameron, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now this one's about like a prisoner or something that uh, is in the electric chair. He escapes and then eventually gets killed and goes to hell, but then finds out he never really escaped at all and is just dead from the electric chair. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. And he so, made this when he was how old? He was 17. Jesus. <laughs> That's awesome. And I think the, the idea that he was a big fan of EC Comics has a big impact on some of the stuff he would do later as well, just like we talked about, like with Romero. Uh, you know, Romero had a history of putting social commentary in his movies. You know, uh, we talked about that a lot during that series. And that's really something, I don't know that we discussed this during the Romero series, but that's definitely something that came from those EC comics. Those EC comics were often commentary on what was happening in the world. You know, they, they, they would use their genre trappings as sort of metaphor for things that were going on in the world. And that's something that Romero definitely used. And it's definitely something that Toby Hooper is going to use throughout his career, including on the film we're talking about today. Uh, absolutely. If you, uh, you know, if there any, if anybody is out there, you know, go pick up your um, most recent issue of heavy metal magazine. I mean, it's all short comics, but you can see, you know, written, be you know, between the lines, they're all commenting on something, be it political, uh, social, uh, religious, whatever. And uh, yeah, this, it just, this just continues that tradition. So as Gary mentioned, Toby Hooper, you know, he spent a lot of time as a kid working on little movies. And in 1962, time to go to college, he enrolls at the University of Texas, and he became one of the first students in their new film program. Uh, because the film program was so new at, at UT at the time, they didn't actually have any filmmaking equipment. They only had like two other students, I think, behind, besides Hooper. So 
Hooper would head down to the local TV station where he would borrow the station's 16 millimeter camera to work on his film projects for school. Eventually, the station manager there, Robert Schinken, began giving Hooper small jobs shooting footage for the station, which led to his first major directing job, which was a feature documentary about the folk singers Peter, Paul, and Mary called The Song is Love. I guess we should also say he's dropped out of school by this time. He only lasted two years at UT because he was more in from, he was more interested in actually going out and making movies than learning how to make movies at school. Nice. That but seems Hooper's to be a first, reoccurring theme too, isn't it? A lot of yeah, those great, a lot of those great a lot. ones say, screw this, I'm going, I'm yeah, just going to go mean, do it. Say fuck I'll, college kids. <laughs> until, until we get into some of the movie brats, like like I mentioned before, De Palma and Spielberg, those are oh, all, sure. and, and George Lucas, those are all, that's like the first generation that was like really, that really came out of film school. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because mm-hmm. film school wasn't really a, much of a thing prior to that. Hooper's first scripted feature was a movie called Eggshells, which was released in 1969. That film was shot for about 40 grand, uh, primarily with a handheld camera uh, that was sort of aping the style of Hooper's idols, Federico Fellini and Michelangelo Antonioni. Uh, If those names sound familiar, you might have an idea of what type of movie Hooper thought he was making when he made Eggshells. Uh, And the, the script, it was... I put in my notes when I put said Hooper's first scripted feature, I put scripted in quotes because there wasn't much of a script. It was mostly just people improvising or they'd write down like, like scribble down notes on napkins, uh, but there wasn't much of a script and they were kind of shooting at this commune of hippies and just was- like had, they'd, they'd have no plan. They'd just go in and figure out what they were going to do that day. But Hooper ended up because there wasn't enough material. He ended up writing in, the the idea of there being like a ghost in the bottom of this house (laughs) yeah i was wondering about this i'm glad you brought up eggshells is on youtube if you look hard enough yeah i've heard it's pretty not good and (laughs) yeah so and i say it's on youtube if you look hard enough by hard enough i mean uh if you can type the words yeah eggshells and toby hooper into the search bar you got it uh i feel okay (laughs) saying that because I don't think you can actually buy this anywhere. So yeah, it's, uh, I don't think it's copyrighted or anything. So. But yeah, I watched uh, about thirty to forty minutes of it today, yeah. and uh, then I was just like, I got to do something else. <laughs> you said that's <laughs> enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> because no offense, Toby, but it was just uh, uh, yeah. It and 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 I'd seen in your notes you mentioned like scripted, and I was like, God, it just feels like these people are just rambling about bullshit. Like it's yeah. just it's like people sitting in a bathtub for 20 minutes, like talking about things. And uh and it's it just, sounds like it's, something like Richard Link later, another Austin guy, uh yeah. would end up doing later on, but it worked in his case because he actually had a plan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and, and like I said, I didn't watch the whole thing, so I don't know. I just know I quit Did you about get the, the stuff time. with the ghost. Yeah, I mean, there was clearly like something weird going on in the basement, and then Did when you I see w- Kim Henkel's dick. I I don't remember seeing Kim Hinkle's dick. Uh, so I was, I was look, I was reading at the same time for this show, but uh, there was an extended like 15 minute scene of a dude who looked stoned as hell uh, with a broadsword dancing around in the basement. And uh, that was, that was <laughs> odd. Uh, definitely saw Kim Hinkle, but yeah. Didn't see his so, well, what, what Hooper's trying to do here is he's, he thinks he's making an art film. Like, that was his intention. He wanted to make an art film. But the film was only ever seen on a few college campuses. And as Hooper puts it, as soon as the lights went down, the Bic lighters would all go on. So this is the 60s, you know, the late 60s. And so people are just getting stoned. Right. Uh, they're watching this movie. It was even, like, it was even advertised as, I think, an American freak illumination or something like that. Like, it was kind of when they promoted um, it on college campuses it was promoted as a as a stoner movie and the movie it didn't make any money because in order to make money people have to pay to see it people it's not unlike it. kubrick when you actually finally get to see the the ghost technically it's just like it spaces you out with a lot of colors and you know, yeah like it's just like <laughs> oh this is trippy man and so yeah but it, it kind of bummed hooper out because he wasn't trying to make a drug movie you know he wasn't trying to make a stoner movie he was trying to make a european style art film Mm-hmm. And most of the actors in Eggshells were non-professionals, or most of them were not actors at all. Uh, but one guy really stood out. This is uh, because he uh, mostly stands out because he appears fully nude in a sequence where he sets fire to his cars and then his clothes before frolicking through a meadow. And that guy's name is, we already mentioned him, but Kim Hinkle. Uh, but Kim Hinkle. He's also uh, in the movie Eggshells. 
<laughs> Kim Hinkle and Hooper became friends and, or at least, uh, you know, acquaintances. They, they, and they wanted to work together again. So Hooper kind of asked for his help in developing a script for a new film. And their, their idea was kind of that it's kind of the same direction that, that George Romero came from, you know, like if we're going to make a movie, then we really want to make some money. What makes money better than a genre movie? What can you make with very little money and no stars that is, is almost guaranteed to turn a profit? A genre movie. So their idea is to tell a modern day telling of the Hansel and Gretel story. Hinkle does sound like a blast, though, by the way. I wanted to say yeah. like it just just for this guy. He was like a textbook illustrator at the time. And he uh, he, he talks about like he would just try to pass the time of like making the teachers and some of the pictures he uh, drew. Like the teacher would be Hitler or uh. Uh, like just other weird little <laughs> things like he could slip <laughs> in to the textbook. So that would be fun to find. But uh, he, he, Did he you guys like ever a draw... hippie and especially in this movie, but he says like he only lasted as a hippie for like a week because he, he said there was just too many rules, even for hippies. He was like, I just found it easier to be a redneck than a hippie. So <laughs> did you guys ever, uh, did you guys ever draw stuff in your textbooks? Like, you know, give George. Oh yeah. All the time or anything like that. I mean, I don't know if I went boner wise because I felt like that could lead to trouble, but maybe like draw a mustache here and there. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. a little, little uh, glasses, <laughs> black out some people's teeth and stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I was always putting like dialogue bubbles next to people. Oh to, yeah, know, say ridiculous shit. Nobody could hunt him <laughs> down though. He, he, I think he used the pseudonym uh, Boris Schnur was like his name, <laughs> like for the for that job or something. Wow. But anyway, so around this time, uh, a friend suggested to Hooper that he see this new film that's playing in town. It was proven to be very popular and causing kind of a big commotion on the UT campus. Like everyone was freaking out about it, saying how cool it was. And that film was George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Uh, and seeing this film sparked something in Hooper's mind uh, because this is what this is the moment where he's like, the best way to get attention for a film, he's like, I don't have the money to go to Hollywood. I don't have the money to make a movie. Like I was saying before, I don't have the money to, to really do a big production. I'm 2000 miles from Hollywood. How do I get them to notice me and make a horror movie? But he didn't have a story for the film. <laughs> so that's the thing. Yeah. I want to make a horror movie and they have the idea to do this Hansel and Gretel thing. Uh, but like, what's the actual story? What are we going to do with this? So shortly after this, uh, and this is a, a very famous story that if you're a fan of this film, you've probably heard. But in the Christmas season of 1972, Toby Hooper finds himself in this crowded Montgomery Ward department store. And there's just Christmas shoppers everywhere. He's getting frustrated. And he finds himself near a display of chainsaws. And he just sort of starts staring at them and spaces out. And he says in his mind, he's doing like a dolly zoom in his mind onto these chainsaws, just watching them. And he, a thought goes through his head and he says, I know a way I could get through this crowd really quickly. <laughs> So, and that's sort of like where the, the idea for this movie originally came from. He goes home, he sits down, and he says the whole story came to him in what seems like about 30 seconds. Uh, so he immediately calls Hinkle, and the two began figuring out the story structure. And they kind of kept the idea of the story being an updated Hansel and Gretel story, but sought to make it more sinister. Uh, so to create a scarier modern version of a witch who likes to cook and eat kids, they started researching real life cannibals and real life serial killers. And one of the main sources of inspiration that they took was a man by the name of Ed Gein. I like the idea of putting Ed Gein and inspiration together in a sentence. There's <laughs> been an inspiration to, to so many. <laughs> there's been Franklin saying failure, failure to plan is planning to fail. And then there's Ed Gein saying, when I see a pretty girl walking down the street, I think two things. One part wants to be real nice and sweet, and the other part wonders what her head would look like on a stick. <laughs> Both are on posters with like mountains and like a sunset and a silhouette of a person. <laughs> <laughs> and Hooper claims that like he did not really know who Ed Gein was, like by name. Uh, he the way he tells it that there was, you know, we're gonna get into Ed Gein's story here, but Hooper says that you know he he would hear stories about this this madman, you know, that it was like this, he was like a boogeyman that parents would tell their kids about when he was a kid. Cause around the time of Ed Gein's crimes, uh, you know, Hooper's pretty young. And, and so he's hearing this stuff as a kid. Well, he said he had heard from like some of his relatives from Wisconsin who would, who, who he said were like, uh, 
they assumed the world was going to end anyway. So they would always tell me like really fucked up stories about stuff. And uh, they would talk about this guy that lived like 20 miles down the road that uh, all I knew was that they, that he would skin people and make furniture. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Ed Gain, Edward Gain was a handyman from Plainfield of Wisconsin who became known as the butcher of Plainfield. Gain's story spread, uh, it gained widespread notoriety in 1957 after authorities discovered that he had exhumed corpses from local graveyards and created trophies and keepsakes, keepsakes from their bones and skin. Gain was also responsible, at least he admitted to, the, uh, the murder of two women, Mary Hogan and Bernice Warden. And it was Warden's death that eventually led to Gain's capture. See, her son Frank Warden was a local deputy sheriff. And when he, he entered the hardware store that his mother ran on the evening of November 16th, 1957, he found the store's cash register open and there, were, there was blood streaked across the floor. He knew something's up. That's what we call a clue. <laughs> so warden told investigators he, he contacts the local authorities he, he's a sheriff's deputy but he, he contacts i guess the local police department there and he tells them that gein had been in the store the previous evening and that he said that he was going to return the next day for a gallon of antifreeze and a sales receipt for a gallon of antifreeze was the last receipt written by Warden on the day that she disappeared, which led authorities to arrest Gein and search his farm. So upon this search, Warden's decapitated body was found in a shed on Gein's property, hung upside down by her legs and dressed out like a deer, like literally gutted like a deer. Like she, she is cut from, from like neck to anus, essentially like in, in her, body open and it's a horrible vision like when you hear stories from the police officers who came in there's no electricity on Gein's farm so they're walking in this old farmhouse with flashlights and this police officer feels he bumps up against something in this shed turns around and it's a headless body hanging upside down gutted and he wa- he goes out and he's like it is the most horrible thing I've That's ever what seen be here <laughs> That's not supposed to be here. So. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Hang on. Murphy, did you? Oh, you guys are playing. Oh. So they decided to search Gein's house. And when they started searching his house, they found, among other things, they found a waste basket made of human skin. They found human skin covering chair seat, skulls used as the tops of bedposts on Gein's bed. They found bowls made out of human skulls, some of which still had food in them. He hadn't done his dishes yet. Uh, they found a corset. That's, that's the truly horrifying thing. <laughs> they found a corset made from a female torso skinned from shoulder to waist. Uh, they found leggings made from human leg skin. They found a belt made of human nipples. They found nine vulva in a shoebox, one of which was painted silver with a red ribbon on it. Oh, they found a pair of lips, a pair of woman's lips on a window shade drawstring. They found a lampshade made from a human face. And most notably for the sake of our story today, several masks made from the skin of female faces. He love to wear the lady skin. That's it. You like to wear the lady skin. I'd fuck me. I'd fuck me. Well, have you seen my, thing, have you seen my so, titty couch? Have you, have you seen it? You gotta, you've got to sit on the titty couch. The titty couch is super comfortable. And it's like, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not biased. It's not old. It's not old lady titties. It's man titties. I keep the lady, t- look, the armrests and the head area is lady titties. Cause that's where you want the most cushion. I've really thought this out. Listen, how, do, how else do you think they got the idea for project runway? You got, you got to lay down on the diners. I'm just make saying before work. you go anywhere else, officers, if you would just, just tell me, am I right? It's like my pillow on steroids. <laughs> Designers, today we've gotten you uh, a clerk from a local hardware store. See what you can do with this. Speaking what of do you, how my do you pillow think... filled with nipples. So just an idea, throwing it out there for the next guy. <laughs> you know, obviously, I'm how do you think up. that human nipple belt was latched? How do you think it latched? That's do you think question. he attached a latch to it? Mm. Baby teeth, because they. Don't they? Mm, he didn't. I he, think if one don't, nipple don't, is don't pierced don't and he could push like somebody with extra long nipples. Like I'm going to say not a lot of pierced nipples in the 1950s well, in Wisconsin. 
maybe. <laughs> well, Gary, it, it is uh, you, you made a little reference there to Buffalo Bill in your in your bit you were doing there. And it should be noted that elements of Gein's story have inspired several important pieces of pop culture over the years, most notably in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and, of course, the Robert Block book that inspired it and in the Buffalo Bill character in The Silence of the Lambs. And, and, and we should say, you you kind of also joked you, he liked dressing up in lady parts. He very much liked dressing up in lady parts, and it's because he had some severe psychological issues. Obviously, he died in a mental hospital, but he had some issues regarding his mother. And we're not, we're not a true crime podcast, so we're not going to get too far into that, but he would essentially dress up as his mother. He would dress up as his mother, uh, by using the body parts of other women. Like he wow. would put on those those leggings made from leg skin. He would put on the torso of a woman's body, which gave him tits. And like, you know, he like and he would wear women's faces. But not just my mama. Did you see the titty couch? So don't forget to tell him about the titty couch. <laughs> <laughs> of course, another major source of inspiration is Leatherface, uh, the soon-to-be star of Toby Hooper's next film. So with this inspiration. Hooper and Hinkle worked on the script, banging out the first draft in about six weeks. And then they settled on a name for the film, which is Head Cheese. I also think it's worth mentioning just for the sake of it that uh, Hinkle also says he ran he ran with Gain, or Gein. He, he, he says that 100%. But also, uh, there was this guy, Elmer Wayne Henley. And if you look at old photos of this guy, Elmer Wayne Henley, uh, he looks a lot like the hitchhiker character and that the dead Neil plays uh, a yeah. little skinny guy whose story is basically that he'd recruit people, mainly younger guys, I think to bring to this older fella named Dean Coral, who would kidnap, rape, torture, murder these guys. And the story's pretty crazy, but eventually Elmer Wayne Henley ended up shooting Coral to stop him. When one of the victims apparently just asked him like, are you going to do anything about this? <laughs> And yeah. uh, when he was arrested, he was very matter of factly just like, all right, I did this stuff. Now I'm going to stop and I'm going to pay for it. Uh, and, and this was going on during like 1970 to 1973. So it would have been big at the time. And what really captured Hinkle, he says, is like this idea that there was this weird morality involved in this guy's mind that, that this kid had. He just wanted to play into it, just like someone doing what they do. And then there's also these weird moments of like, like, like morality. in the movie. Yeah, the morality. <laughs> yeah. Like the old man, I'm sure we'll talk about, but it's like when the old man gets pissed because Leatherface tears up the door. And right. he's just like, don't you have any pride in your home? Yeah. And it's, it was weird because I almost, I almost like in the movie, and I know we're not there yet but like you there there are moments if you watch it there are moments that you almost even feel for leatherface at times obviously oh, absolutely. yeah he's like a handicapped dude and there's moments where he's just like why the fuck do people keep coming to my house like what am i <laughs> supposed to do <laughs> and, uh, uh it, by the way El elmer wayne henley if you're a fan of the show mind hunter uh on netflix he a is a character show. that gets interviewed uh, by by Holden oh, and Matt, nice. I think in season two. Yeah, supposedly part of the Hansel and Gretel idea is where they were going to have like a troll under the bridge, and that eventually. Yeah, that was their that well that was that was Hooper's original idea uh, is to is to have a troll under the bridge as the monster, and Kent Hinkle was like, "That is stupid, and we're yeah. not doing that." <laughs> supposedly, a lot of that part went to the Leatherface character, but right. uh, he also says like a main factor in it was his family doctor. Dr. Martin, Doc Martin, but he said, quote, uh, Doc Martin, he delivered me. I remember that he once told me this story about how when he was a pre-med student, the class was studying cadavers and he went into the morgue and skinned a cadaver and made a mask for Halloween. We decided Jesus. Leatherface, yeah, he said we decided <laughs> Leatherface would have a different human skin mask to fit, fit each of his moods. The, um, the day that the, my doctor tells me that story is the right. day that I find a new doctor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, one I'd other be, thing I'd I wanted like, to add. I would be backing out of that room like Homer just going into the bush. <laughs> yep. <laughs> maybe. All right, Doc. Maybe we'll be this you. is not the guy uh, to check your cough, Mom. Finger like, guns. Just gonna, yeah. I forgot something in my car. Uh, right another positive to mention here, just because it's nice to see the chain of things, like you mentioned uh, Night of the Living Dead earlier, and I love seeing the connections, but the guys also admit to being inspired or at least motivated by. Uh, the Legend of Boggy Creek, uh, which was out in 72 and it was touring around and kind of great killing movie. it at the drive-ins. But it was directed great. by Charles B. Pierce, who would go on to do The Town That Dreaded Sundown. 
Um, I don't know if you're serious or not. I remember hating the legend of Boggy Creek. Oh, the first uh, one's good. The second one's terrible. Is this the first I, one or the second one? I think one? he did both, but I think this is okay. the first one. The but he would, go, he would go on right after this to the town that dreaded sundown. But uh, it's sort of, if you're not familiar with this, like a Bigfoot movie. And yeah, uh, yeah. But anyway, the reason I think it matters is because, A, it's, it's definitely a like a documentary style film. And it's a uh, found footage. Yeah. Quote, unquote, based on a true story. And uh, yeah. And anyway, and B, it also kept everybody motivated or, or Hinkle and, uh, and Hooper motivated because it was succeeding. Like it was killing it. And uh, yeah. they were just, they were like, oh, this is going to work. And it was made for no money. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so with a screenplay in place, Hooper and Hinkle formed a production company called Vortex Incorporated. And they went to a man named Bill Parsley to help with funding. So Parsley was essentially a, politician there in texas he was the vice president of financial affairs at texas tech but he fancied himself a movie producer he'd already produced a couple of features uh neither of which they're both kind of lost to history uh but you know that's what he kind of told people he told people he was a movie producer right Hooper and Hinkle were introduced to Parsley by a guy named Warren Scarron, who was the head of the newly formed Texas Film Commission. Film commissions in, in states were not really a thing at the time. Arizona had had one that Scarron kind of saw, he saw how successful it had been, brought a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, income into Arizona. So he went to the Texas government and asked them to make one for Texas. And he was the head of it. So he was the very first one to, to head that up. And so he was eager to get some homegrown projects into production. So after meeting with Hooper and Hinkle, Bill Parsley raised $60,000 for the film's budget in exchange for 50% of the picture. I think $40,000 of that 60 was out of Bill Parsley's own pocket, like oh, his wow. personal money. It's important to say too, on that, it was a deal that it's like for 50% of the picture, except if they weren't done in a certain amount of time or it didn't get completed, he owned 100% of whatever right. they did. And Scarron, for, for his part, aside from brokering the deal between Parsley and the filmmakers, he made one other major contribution to the film. So just a week before principal photography began, he suggested that Hooper and Hinkle throw out their working titles, which we mentioned with Head Cheese was the original title, which is a horrible title. Um, it's also the name kinda, of the Al, like, like Al, Al Snow and Steve Blackman's tag team in WWE. <laughs> <laughs> There's our wrestling <laughs> reference for the week. I mean, honest, I love Head Cheese as a culinary dish. I think it's delicious. Uh, but I don't know how much marketing potential it has. Uh, they were also at, at one point changed it to Leatherface, which is a cool title if you know who Leatherface is, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, so, Scarin, he suggested that they call the film the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is a stroke of genius because it's one of the greatest movie titles of all oh, time. It's perfect. But have you ever had head cheese out of a human skull? That's I can't question. say I have, Ed. Have you Have you ever had head cheese out of a human skull sitting on the titty couch? Because that's that's the real <laughs> kicker. I think, feel like you should have a Wisconsin accent or what you're why you're doing Oh, this. that's a good point. Yeah, you're doing, you're doing I more of a feel Texas. like I've been fucking it up. Well, because all I can do Wisconsin wise is like, I am Bobby. Have you ever had? Oh, wait, no, that sounds Irish. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got yeah. to have the head. Oh, no, yeah. I always go no, Irish. You went Scottish. You're going yeah. Scottish or something. <laughs> Get <laughs> in my belly, people. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> blatherface. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got my cheese on coming for you. I can't get my bill <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so most of the film was cast with relatively unknown actors. Uh, the lead role of Sally went to a 21-year-old Texas uh, University of Texas student named Marilyn Burns. Wait, before we get to Marilyn Burns, but I, I, got, I got sidetracked with the joking, but I did want to say that one of the cool parts I loved about Warren Scarin was that one of the first movies he did as the uh, Texas Film Commission or whatever that he promoted was the movie Love and Molly with uh, Anthony yeah. Perkins and uh, I forget who else. But anyway, which Toby Directed Hooper, by Sidney Lumet, I believe. That is correct, yeah. yeah. And uh, Toby Hooper was on the set of Love and Molly uh still in chicken sort of. wings <laughs> just stealing food <laughs> <laughs> he stole he stole some chicken wings and he got kicked off the set well he was standing in line and they were like do you work here and he's like no nah. and uh that's from the <laughs> joe bob article but like joe bob asked he was like why were you there and he's like 
I don't remember. <laughs> it was just, he's like, I, just, I guess I, I just got hungry. somebody or something and I got hungry. <laughs> and so I got lied. But also worth mentioning from all that is the other guy, uh, Robert, uh, there was Robert Kuhn, who was the lawyer for Parsley that drew up the paperwork and ended up buying into the enthusiasm for everything. He donated a bit. And another one of his clients was a Richard Sainz, who also threw in, who still somehow gets listed as an official producer when some of these guys don't. Um, but he's along with Parsley, Parsley, Hooper, and Hinkle, like on the credits. And I guess it's because he still owns like 6.24% of the movie. But he's just funny because he's been wanted ever since on fugitive drug charges. And oh, uh, he, <laughs> he's been like on the run since like the 70s and 80s. And the cops never found him. His house had an escape tunnel built in it. And, uh, but anyway, somehow he's apparently always been able to collect his royalty checks. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned Love and Molly. Love and Molly was a big deal, and it, it's actually kind of an interesting part of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre <laughs> story right. because um, Marilyn Burns worked on that movie as well. Well, she was originally cast in a role, and then Sidney Lumet had like been, they kind of had to like be like, oh, sorry, we kind of promised this role to somebody else. And that somebody else was a young Susan Sarandon. Yeah. Which oh. is, but they let, but they let, Marilyn Burns hang around and she was like the stand in for Blythe Danner and Susan Sarandon, even though she is not the same height or build as either of them. But she, <laughs> she got a job as their standing just because Sydney Lebeck kind of felt bad about firing her. She can verify, by the way, that she does remember Hooper from the chicken incident. Does she? <laughs> so, that's the only other time she'd ever seen him, but she, yeah. she, she remembered that. Yeah. And you got to think Hooper at this time, you know, when, when you describe him, wandering on a set and eating a chicken wing he's a hippie he looks like a hippie like that's uh, hooper if you listen to him in interviews i don't know if, i don't know who says man more him or george romero in interviews right. like that you know they he's he's a hippie at heart he really is anyway so marilyn burns she's a drama student at the university of texas she's the only actress on the texas film commission it's all men otherwise and she would volunteer to do office work for scaring as part of the texas film commission and she's volunteering to do office work, but she's really doing it. Her real motives were to just find out who was making the next movie in Texas and how she could get on that movie. So she ended up getting some bit parts. I mean, we mentioned we mentioned Love and Molly, but also uh, she had a small part in Robert Altman's Brewster McLeod when it fil filmed there. And at the same time, while she's getting these small acting jobs, she's also a cocktail waitress at a place called Villa Capri, which is a bar where Bill Parsley and his kind of cronies hung out most nights. One night, Bill Parsley tells Marilyn Burns that he owned half of a horror movie that was about to be made, and he wanted her to star in it. Marilyn Burns goes into the audition, and she got the part almost immediately. Kim Hinkle, the way he recalled it is this. Toby always liked busty women, and Marilyn's a busty woman, and, well, he was enchanted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you kind of gave Marilyn Burns credit. I keep wanting to give her credit where it's due. Like she, there were all kinds of stories about Marilyn Burns just, like, being on it. Like, even in, like, plays and stuff, she was just, like, going out of her way to camp it up or do whatever it could to be, like, stand out, even if she's in a right. role as an extra. Uh, there, there was some movie, I forget what it was, where there's, like, extras running, and she would just, like, make sure she was faster than every other extra to get her face on the screen. She knew where the camera was. <laughs> she would make sure she's seen. Uh, she was going to be a star, by God. And, uh, yeah, so Toby Hooper, uh, you know, even though she says she remembered him, I guess, uh, I don't think he remembered her necessarily, but like Justin said, we'll just say she she showed up at the uh, University of Texas auditions and uh, her personality was big enough for Toby. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the rest of the cast is composed of local community theater actors or small time actors who'd appear in local commercials, even a few friends and relatives of, of Hooper and the crew. Uh, Alan Danziger, who plays Jerry, was an acquaintance of Hooper who had appeared in Eggshells. Uh, Terry McMinn, played Pam, and she was a local actress as well. And William Vale played Kirk in the film. And Terry then everyone's McMahon, favorite... I, oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, Terry McMahon, I feel like she was doing some other stuff. Like she had been on some touring stuff or something because she was a little bit higher up than some of yeah, them. Yeah, she was working on a play at the time. I think she would like do the play at night and do this like during the day. 
Yeah, I remember just reading stuff about her, like uh, as we're going to get into that, she was just like one of the people that was just like, this is never even happening. This is not going to be a movie. William Vale, by the way, still working today as a set decorator, most notably yeah. on Gilmore Girls. So, hey, William Vale, good job. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, but uh, and, and, and it's worth mentioning too, John Dugan, uh, who plays grandfather. Uh, yep. He was, so I, I've seen it, people call him Kim Hinkle's nephew. But I saw from his own mouth, he said he was his brother-in-law and uh, that he was married to the sister who had donated money to the I mean, thing. This is Texas. It could be the same thing. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he just he just came on, I think, as a favor. Like Kim just called him on us. We need you to do this thing. And he's in the thing. And he said, like, the, literally the only direction he ever got was he was like, we're going to have you play an embry-. He said it, he specifically remembers. They said embryonic old man. Yeah. And uh, that you a good just, description. Yeah. And, uh, and so he said like the only direct like direction he ever got from Toby was just like, uh, when he does the finger sucking thing, he's like, you ever seen a baby sucking to get giddy and their hands bounce back and forth. He's like, just gotta do that. <laughs> so he does it. It's real creepy when he does it <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, and then of course we've got everyone's favorite annoying brother, Franklin played by Paul Partain. Paul Partain was a Vietnam vet who had been enrolled at the UT drama school and everyone fucking hated this guy on set. Like he, everybody, everyone hated him. Cause he was like a method actor kind of guy, you know? So he acted just whiny and like a little bitch, just like he does in the movie. And everyone just like was sick of this fucking guy. I, I have Maryland. never, there has never been a character a victim in a horror movie that I've that I want to die more than I want Franklin to die, and he's handicapped. I should feel bad about that, but he's a little bitch. As Joe Bob says, he literally plays the fifth wheel in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, uh, <laughs> but he's, uh, yeah, he 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 just man, they're, they're literally. Uh, I keep saying literally now. Uh, this past week, I saw on Twitter somebody posted uh, who who is the most annoying character in Hollywood or in horror movies. And I went there to post Franklin because I couldn't think of anybody, but it had already, he'd already been there. Everybody was posting of Franklin, <laughs> um, him and Shelly from Friday, the 13th part three. Those are the yeah, ones that okay. get posted a lot, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's, he is just the worst. And supposedly yeah. like even Gunner, like legitimately hated him. And yeah. uh, it wasn't until like a, uh, like a convention way later that he met Paul Partain, they actually became friends because he he just didn't realize that how method this guy was. And they actually got along at the convention. Once he and, realized he wasn't that person. Yeah, and they life. stayed friends uh, yeah. their whole life. But anyway. So Ed Neal was another drama student there at UT. And he kind of got the part. He's another veteran as well, another Vietnam vet. And he kind of got the part by chance when he sort of randomly wandered into an audition. Like he, he, uh, the story goes that he was getting drunk at a nearby bar. Cause he had to play drunk in a play he was doing. Yeah. So that's the thing you I can guess do. That, I guess that's method. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just actually get drunk. And then he w goes onto campus and someone's like, Hey, you trying out for the movie. And he just like walks in <laughs> to, to the audition. Yeah. It will be, they were like, are you here for the movie? And he's like, what movie? They're like, they're filming a movie over there. And he's like, okay. And he walks in. He said, like, Toby Cooper just walks up to him. He's like, are you here to read for the role? And he's like, yeah, the role. I'm going to, I'm going to read for it. And, it sounds uh, like, um, this sounds like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Yeah, yeah. God, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's a good thought. point. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he reads for it. And so, yeah, he says he sees this hitchhiker role and he's reading it and he realizes it sounds exactly like his nephew who is apparently suffering from like paranoid schizophrenia yeah, and well proceeds as such like, uh, yeah, he plays kinda... him, plays him as a, as a paranoid schizophrenic. Yeah. When he walked in, Toby Hooper was like, can you be weird? And his buddy who was with him was like, he's always weird. So he's, <laughs> he's not. And Ed Neal is, is quite a character in this story. Cause he's someone who gets pretty, uh, pretty pissed off about every, everything that went down on this movie later on. But of course, what would become one of the most iconic monsters in also, the history? Also, by the way, sorry, I keep, I keep stepping on you, Justin. I apologize. You sure do. 
but it's just it's <laughs> worth mentioning. I, I wasn't ready for you to move on yet because I thought you were saying something else about Ed Neal. I wanted to point out that he is also the owner of one of the world's largest movie poster collections dating from 1900 onwards. It's a good tip there, <laughs> I just thought you'd Thank like you. to know. That's a fun <laughs> fact. It's a little something extra we could give the people. That's value. That's value to our listeners. So as I was saying, in what Proceed. would become one of the most iconic monsters in film history, Gunnar Hansen was cast as Leatherface. So Hansen is six foot four. He's about 300 pounds. He is a hulking figure. He's huge. Sound like and a bitch. <laughs> he's born in Iceland, but raised in Texas. Well, raised in Maine and then mostly Texas. Uh, he also attended UT where he majored in English and math before going to grad school uh, studying in uh, Scandinavian studies. And as a college student, he began doing some theater work. And when he heard that Texas Chainsaw Massacre was being filmed, he auditioned for the role and easily won the part. Uh, well, it, it wasn't that easy off the bat. The, the role had already been cast, but the actor who had been cast as Leatherface, and I don't know who it was, I can't find that information anywhere, but he apparently got drunk in a motel and refused to leave, so they just fired him. So that's how Gunnar Hansen ended up getting the part. But he shows up to the audition and Toby Hooper sees him like coming across the street and this like giant dude. And he said, Toby Hooper said he walked in and just like filled the doorway and basically immediately got the role. So in preparing for the role, Hanson had decided that Leatherface would, was mentally challenged. And he actually, and, and he's like, okay, this guy's mentally challenged. He's never developed properly. He's never learned to speak. Uh, so to kind of prepare to play that, he visited a special needs school to kind of study how the kids moved and interacted with each other. And you can really see that in his performance in this. I think he's not like, hes not playing him just like a mindless killer necessarily, like a Jason. When I was watching the family portrait documentary, like he's talking about like he, I, I was just wondering, I was like, can this fly today that he, he apparently like basically checked in. He was there pretending to be a student or client or whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, I don't want to call it like an inmate, although he does in the documentary, but of this place just pretends to be mentally challenged, like in the place to try to pick up all of this stuff. It's just kind of interesting to, to see that. Like, I'm not sure that I don't think it would work out. Well, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it would be possible these days. I think it would be harder to, to uh, kind of fake your way into that there'd be a lot i think record keeping's a little bit better now that it wasn't yeah <laughs> so, yeah true yeah. so we, we've got most of the cast in place but and, and then hooper finds out he's required to hire at least one card carrying member of the screen actors guild uh for some reason he has to hire at least one sag member and he had to pay at least one sag member at union scale and he i think he had to hire like two union crew members or something so he contacted Jim Seedow, who he had met a few years earlier on the set of another Texas film movie. Uh, one, it, it's one I can't remember the name of it. I didn't write it down. The it wind wasn't that splitter. Important. Yeah, it was described as like a Texas Easy Rider, and Toby Hooper is actually in it. He plays like a villain or something, and he's an actor in it. Uh, but anyway, they met there, and then Seedow says he he never heard, and they didn't keep in contact. And then one day, Toby Hooper just kind of calls him out of the blue and offers him this role in the movie and he gets cast as the cook, which is probably the most, I'd say morally complex of the family in this. Yeah. Yeah. It was the wind splitter. I did look that up um, for anybody who's wondering, but see now, yeah, like you said, he didn't remember who the hell he was. And yeah. uh, I don't know if he like just stood out to Hooper or something. There was never really any explanation I saw about it. And they, even as his part, you know, since they, Obviously, like you said, they had to pay him as part of SAG and all of this stuff. They even offered him like to pay him in shares of the movie, unlike everybody else. He just said, I'll take cash, thanks. But yeah. it, which in retrospect might have been smarter at the time. <laughs> so I don't well, know. Yeah. So the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was filmed primarily in Round Rock, Texas in the summer of 1973. Round Rock, Texas at the time was very rural. It's not as much so anymore. Uh, while the $60,000 budget was about 20 grand more than Hooper had used on eggshells, that's still a pretty tiny budget, even for the early 1970s. And because of the tight budget, there weren't many amenities for the cast and crew of about 40 people. So, uh, so most of the sh shoot is taking place in and around this farmhouse that they, they had rented. And those 40 people had to share the single restroom 
in this house. They're also all very green. They're all very new to filmmaking. Everyone on the crew. Uh, Daniel Pearl is the cinematographer. He had never shot a feature. He was a documentary filmmaker, a student, never shot a feature film. Ron Bosman was the production manager. He had never managed a film. Uh, Bosman would go on to win an Oscar as a producer on Silence of the Lambs nice. later on. But So he had a pretty good career, but this was his first movie. They didn't have a prop guy. I mean, Bosman found himself in that role too. He's the guy who had to go out and buy the chainsaw. They didn't have a chainsaw. Yeah, so he, he, said, to, he and, says like nowadays, like this was his first time doing this, but like, you know, now you know if you're doing a movie called Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you have like 20 chainsaws. <laughs> he's like but we didn't have any they got one they only yeah. got one and as is the case on a lot of underfunded films the film had to shoot constantly it shot for seven days a week often 12 to 16 hours a day salaries for the crew ranged from 50 dollars to 125 dollars for the entire shoot that's not a per day total that's for the in- total for the entire Jeez. shoot Uh, So needless to say, a lot of the crew didn't feel compelled to show up on time. Uh, They didn't feel compelled to do any really extra work that wasn't in their job description. And a lot of them would end up walking off the set in the middle of the shoot. They wouldn't stick around for the whole thing because you're getting paid 50 bucks. Who gives a shit? (laughs) And it probably didn't help matters that the the cannibal house would get up to 115 degrees. So Mm -hmm. remember, this is Texas in July, and it's a a particularly hot Texas in July. So – Outside temperatures were well uh, in the upper 90s to 100 degrees. So inside this house, it's like 115, 120 degrees. And also remember that this house is filled with animal carcasses and rotting meat. So so Bob Burns, Bob Burns is the guy responsible for that. Bob Burns was the film's art director. Uh, This was his first film as well. Although He would go on to be the art director for several legendary horror films, including The Hills Have Eyes. Uh, the Howling and Reanimator. In fact, The Hills Have Eyes, he actually reuses props from this movie on that one. And because the film had a minuscule budget, they couldn't exactly hire a special effects company. They weren't hiring Tom Savini for this one to create fake bones and fake animal parts. Instead, Bob Burns indulged in his lifelong fascination with animal bones by rounding up eight dead cows, two deer, three goats, one chicken, an armadillo, and two human skeletons. Oh, well, one of them was plastic, but one of them was real because it was cheaper. Holy cheaper crap. to buy. He said it was cheaper to buy a human skeleton and get it sent to you from India as like a medical specimen than it was to find a fake human skeleton. So oh like that God. opening shot of this movie where you see those two skeletons, one of those is real. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> and this stuff is in this house just sitting and baking in the Texas heat. Uh, the cell, this the smell was so bad that after a scene was shot, the actors would like run to the windows to throw up. Like they'd yell cut, and then everyone run, would run to the window and puke because it was just unbearable. Well, I was gonna say, like Ed Neal like talks about like just being in that scene and like getting direction from Hooper, who's just like saying, like, your nose is scrunched up. Like, what are you doing over there? Blah blah blah. And he's like, I'm trying not to project all vomit all over the fucking place, man. <laughs> like he's like, I'm sorry, my nose scrunched up. Yeah, and the, and the actors themselves didn't smell great either because remember, we're on a low budget. That means not much of a wardrobe department. That means because the story takes place over the course of a day. I mean, the, the, this whole story takes place in less than 24 hours, but it's shooting for weeks. The actors were wearing the same exact sweaty outfit each and every day. Uh, Gunnar Hansen said that by the end of the shoot, no one would sit next to him at lunch because he smelled so bad. Because uh, Gunnar Hansen's a big dude. Yeah, he's a big yeah. dude, and he's wearing a latex mask that he wasn't allowed to take off because they were worried about being able to get it back on. Uh, so all day he's wearing this and just sweating and just stinking, oh. and nobody nobody would sit next to him. He oh, had to eat God. alone. Uh, Marilyn Burns said that by the end of shooting, her outfit was covered in so much stage blood that it was practically solid. Uh, she would spend her breaks. A lot of people thought that she was getting special treatment, I think, a little bit, uh, and thought that she was being seen as better because of her relationship or perceived relationship with Bill Parsley. So she she would spend her breaks in his air-conditioned Cadillac, because he would often visit the set, while the rest of them sweltered in, in this Texas heat. Uh, yeah, and, and in her defense, what she was trying to do was play peacemaker a lot of the times because Parsley had been basically saying, like, to I think his son and like other people that he was dealing with a bunch of neurotic wannabe stars 
uh, the way that like he would go, he would show up on set and Hooper would kind of ignore him. And Hinkle was just too busy. Didn't have well, he was still seen him. as the man. By yeah. Toby so Hooper. yeah, yeah, exactly. He was the establishment. He was the dude. And uh, so she, she tells the story that she was trying to make friends and basically say, you know, that's cool. Like just, you know, people just view you this way. Cause you're the, the big guy in charge. Like maybe, uh, step back and let's just let this play out. People get intimidated when you're here and that sort of thing. And so like they were having those kind of conversations basically. Yeah. I mean, but there, and there was reason to believe that her and Parsley had some sort of relationship. I don't know if it was an actual romantic relationship or if he was uh, just infatuated with her. He's an older, an older man, you know, older Texan, this young, beautiful, you know, blonde girl walks into your life and he his so he he established a production company, uh, as off is often the practice when you're producing a movie. You create these little production companies. That's why a lot of times you'll see a little a production company name at the beginning beginning of the movie that's very specific, like to that movie, you know. Right. Um, and his was named MAB. MAB mm. are Marilyn Burns's initials. I did not know that. Interesting. Yeah. And there's also the story that apparently. Uh, in her um, like sophomore or, or junior year at college, she showed up one day and she had, she was seemingly more developed, let's say, than she had been before the summer break. Uh-huh. And there was rumor that Mr. Parsley uh, funded that as well. Oh, she got hair extensions put in. <laughs> hair extensions. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That makes perfect <laughs> right. sense. Somebody's making a new uh, end cushion for the titty couch. <laughs> <laughs> so most of most of these uh these actors were not too fond of hooper either hooper had this kind of aloofness that i think came from just him being kind of a hippie you know uh that made a lot of them feel like he didn't really know what he was doing it felt to the to a lot of the cast like he was just kind of making things up as he went along changing his mind regularly on set they just kind of thought he was lost which i don't think is actually the case i think that's just hooper's personality uh, and and nearly all of them were injured at one point or another during the shoot. Uh, Ed Neal had his face burned by hot asphalt in a scene where he like after he, he is kicked out of the van. There's a scene where he's like on the asphalt. It gets cut out of the final film, but he burned his face. Uh, Partain bruised and cut his arm when rolling down a hill. That at the beginning of the movie when he gets spooked by the truck going by and just rolls down a the hill like a dummy. Uh, <laughs> then Hanson slipped and fell while he's running with a chainsaw because remember for a lot of this movie not only is Hanson running around but he's running aware around in these uh, cowboy boots with high heels on them and a mask where he has no peripheral vision so at one point Hanson's running around he falls while carrying a chainsaw chainsaw flies in the air and lands like inches from his head they didn't, That's bother, the point they didn't that, bother to take the chain off did they yeah they took the chain off oh they did oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. they ended right. up taking it off yeah they, for they most ended part. up taking the chain off yeah for most uh, there are some Neil, shots with it's on but yeah that and neil thing like he talks about <laughs> that he's just like i don't know why i didn't say anything he's just like i just thought for the love of filmmaking i guess like i was just there and he's like he to hear him describe it he's like you know you watch the news reports and then like somebody just like takes a egg and like cracks it open on the cement on a hot sweltering day and then it's like everybody gathers around they're like oh it's actually cooking the egg he was like well that's that's what it's like here that was was my face face was on asphalt (laughs) and he's like and i'm laying there and i can hear it cooking my face and he's like and i didn't have enough sense to like pop up and say like wait a fucking second here (laughs) <laughs> and he's like and yeah, also- Ed Neal did not have a great experience on this film he he said that he's like I led troops through Vietnam and that was still not as bad as making this movie Oof. he was he was saying that, that the two on the asphalt scene he was like and then like that scene like my, my jaw is supposed to be broken so then they take you know he's like they don't have like oh this is this is art house cinema you know this is indie movie making we don't have time to make like a prosthetic or make anything like special just take this rock and put it under your jaw and like make it kind of disheveled looking a little bit. So it looks like your jaws like a little unhinged there and say, so I'm laying on the hot ass asphalt and I've got this rock under my jaw and then I'm just doing all of this stuff. And he's like, but the love of filmmaking. And then they didn't use the fucking shot. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh man. And, and Marilyn Burns probably got the worst of it. Like she was tied up, dragged, bruised, cut. She's chased through underbrush. She's hit on the head with a rubber hammer. Uh, she's drenched in sticky fake blood. Uh, she, there, there are scenes where she's, you know, falling on her knees 17 times in a row because Hooper made her kept doing it over and over, just destroying her knees. And like, she's, she's getting pretty beat up and she's, she's pretty banged up by the end of the shoot. Speaking of we, rubber we hammer. Talked when, about, we talked about poor Uma. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like poor Marilyn. I mean. Uh, Le- at least Uma had Zoe Bell for a yeah. lot of stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, you talk about uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the old man. I mean, when he's like beating her in the room like i mean he tells the story like he was just like everything he tried to do they kept being like it doesn't look good it looks fake and they kept yeah. trying to be like you're exactly. gonna have to hit her you're gonna and have to really hit her they they he, cut her they really cut her finger too yeah. uh in that last really? scene yeah because they couldn't get the stage they couldn't get the special effect to work and the stage blood to like come out of the knife so finally like gunner hansen was like all right we're just gonna have to really do it and they really cut her finger with a knife oh <laughs> yeah. shit yeah uh, yeah, so th- and that that Last Supper scene is, by all accounts, like the heart, one of the toughest scenes to shoot. So Daniel Pearl is using this low-speed, fine-grained 16-millimeter film, and that required about four times as much light as, like, a modern-day film would. Oh, so they've shit. just got these lights on this set. That This scene takes place at night, but they're shooting during the day. So they've got these big, heavy blankets over the window just keeping all the heat in. Oh. and it was about 95 degrees before they turned on all the lights. And they shot this scene for like, Ed Neal says 36 hours. Everything else I've read says about 26, 27 hours. But tw- let's say 27 hours. They're shooting for 27 hours straight in a hot, stinking, rotting room. Mm. Uh, the, the, the sausages on the table were real. They'd been there for 18 days. They filled these sausages with formaldehyde to keep them from like, rotting away but they were like they were so filled with formaldehyde that they were starting to like they were puffing up and like threatening to burst and they just smell awful and just sitting under these lights john dugan who plays grandpa sawyer had to stay in his old age makeup the whole time because they couldn't take it off and put it back on not in one day they would have to come back another day and gunner hansen talks about this scene he was so like exhausted by the end of it that there's a there's a moment he says where 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 I think it's the hitchhiker says to him hey, kill the bitch and he thinks in his head yes kill the bitch <laughs> he's like he's like <laughs> I had he's like I was so exhausted that at, at this point I I truly like became Leatherface for a moment and then on the wow. final night of the shoot Dottie Pearl so Dottie Pearl is was Daniel Pearl's wife at the time and she's the film's makeup artist she made brownies for everyone that's really nice right for the last day of the shoot mm, uh, and this was the night where they're gonna shoot uh, the scene where Leatherface has to cut the door of the house with a chainsaw you know so they're mm-hmm. actually having to use the chain on the saw so that he can cut through the door so they actually you know they normally like we said they had taken it off for safety purposes but in this scene they needed it so everyone's eating brownies and then all of a sudden everyone's like everyone put the brownies away toby hooper's mom is here we got to put these brownies away and that's when it dawned on them these were not regular brownies they had a special ingredient these brownies oh turns out gunner hansen gunner hansen who had had a brownie had never partaken in marijuana before in his life and he has to shoot a scene <laughs> where he's got a live chainsaw cutting through a door and he is high as a fucking kite the entire time. <laughs> like his pupils are the size of quarters. It's also about being <laughs> sweaty and like just being like, I can't breathe right. I feel like I'm going to die. Like I'm just, and he's just going through the door. You know, he has no idea what he's doing. And Hooper being like, this is perfect cut. That's it. Yeah. That's and right. this is like the last thing they shoot for the entire movie. So. Oh wow! <laughs> and even Hooper himself says there's like days of filming he doesn't remember because of that, or, or like a day of filming he doesn't remember maybe because of that. But yeah, crazy. And then Toby Hooper spent the next eight months editing the film, and he had spent a lot of that time trying to figure out what he could get away with because uh, one of the you know kind of legends about this movie is that he would call the MPAA MPAA a lot, asking them questions because he wanted to get a PG rating for the film so that kids could see it. So he would ask them like, <laughs> okay, can I get a PG rating if I'm hanging, if there's a scene where I have to hang a girl from a meat hook? They're like, uh, no, <laughs> no. They're like, what if I don't show her getting impaled on the meat hook? 
So he would like go through these conversations, which leads to part of what makes this movie so powerful. And we'll get to that in a minute, I think. Like, like Gary said, there's a lot of information about this movie out there. And some of this I'm going to breeze over a little bit because it's a lot of financial stuff that's a little bit boring to get into. But they basically needed to drum up more funds. They'd ran out of the $60,000. that was. If I could briefly film. say, too, by the way, I, I saw a bunch of stuff where Gunnar Hansen completely disputes that, that Hooper was going for a PG. He did. Yeah, Gunnar Hansen does say that that the the guts the, the all the gore and the the violence was all in the uh in the script which that may have been the case but that doesn't mean that Hooper was didn't have that mindset during the editing process. Right, right. Yeah. So, and, and and to be fair too, I mean a couple of things to to point out like maybe you were going to get here but um with Hooper cuz I feel like we bashed him a little bit here but um, the idea that he didn't know what was going on, a lot of people look back on it now and it's like, they look at it as possibly, and especially like with Joe Bob stuff too, that, um, that that's just how like Hooper wanted everybody on edge and uncomfortable. And oh, I absolutely agree. Yeah. That yeah. That I, was I, like I his wasn't goal. Yeah. I, I was saying that that was the perception that at the time of filming that people thought, that uh, that he didn't know what he was doing, but I I believe and, and it was also fully just inten- that intentional that, that he didn't know where he was going with what he was shooting, but it was just like no, he's just trying to get everything on screen that he can because he knows his movie is going to be made in the Built in the room. editing, yeah, yeah, absolutely, I absolutely. So they had to get a little bit more money because the film was in the processing lab and they didn't have the money to pay the processing lab to get their film back, so they had to raise a little bit more money uh, and and. They ended up doing that through some financial, you know, finagling, and they ended up finishing the movie. I know you don't want to cover all of this, but what I did think of was cool about this is that what ended up happening, just long story short, is the lab had overprocessed the whole dinner scene, and there were like flakes on the screen or something like that. It was like some weird situation, and they were going to have to be hand cleaned, uh, fourteen thousand frames. And the way that he got around this was Hooper found an old timer from like the golden age of Hollywood who had dealt with this before. And he said he met this guy and uh, the old guy told him, he was like, oh no, I'll do this. This is a lucky film. We always believed movies like this is what make it. And he like, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and he did, he did the whole thing, like 14,000 frames with a Q-tip, like cleaned off oh, every crazy. single frame. Wow. Uh, yeah, then they go to the to like like you were saying they they had to have this extra money to get it back, and then they go to like Parsley, uh, and Parsley was like done with everything, and he told them, well, like you said before, he's like, if they don't finish it, he owns a hundred percent of it, and then he can just take the film and do whatever the fuck he wants with it. Right, Hinkle saying he essentially like quote the, the he had us by the short hairs, like if we don't yeah. finish this film, then whatever, uh, and then. Hopefully, I'm not jumping ahead here, but 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 Hinkle ends up telling his b- buddy, who's a screenwriter, Bill Whitliff, who passed it on to his attorney, who's a former member of the antitrust board, who then tells his whole poker game, his regular weekly poker game, and they all invest into a 19% share of Vortex, the production yeah. company. And Jesus, this story. It's just so much. But anyway, yeah, th- their investment, which I think they agreed to – because because it was like a tax write off too somehow for them there was some kind of rule in and place. a lot some of them a lot of the members of that poker game still get royalty checks from this movie yeah and nice. lonely <laughs> I think uh, lonely was the 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 lawyer he kind of fudged their share too even kind of lied to us like he had thirty five percent they really got like seventeen percent or something because it was because vortex only owned half the movie. Right, right. So anyway, they called, they created a new firm, like you were talking about earlier, like a new production firm. It was called Pitts, which stood for pie in the sky, because they were all just kind of like, this isn't going to do anything anyway. Yeah. (laughs) But like you said, I mean, in some of the interviews I saw, they were like, oh yeah, I got a $700 check for this movie the other day. (laughs) (laughs) Warren Scarron then comes to the rescue again and helped the film get a distribution deal with New York-based Bryanston distributors. It, It had been sent to like paramount actually almost distributed the movie and then some of the people on the board were like uh i don't think we want to distribute this kind of movie through paramount uh so they ended up passing on it but yeah bryanston distributors ended up 
getting the film. I think they they offered like two hundred and twenty five grand for it, which so Parsley was like, hell yeah, that's you know I've I've already made all my money and then some off of this. So yeah, sell it. So the film was first shown to an audience in October of nineteen seventy four. So there is a there's a special screening, like a sneak preview of a movie called the The Taking of Pelham One Two Three. Great movie, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Not the remake with Denzel. I mean, that one's all right too. Isn't Denzel in that? The remake and like Chris Pine. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. pretty mm-hmm. solid. But the original one is really outstanding. Anyway, yeah, the original is great. Anyway, so there's a there's like a special screening of that. It's in San Francisco. There's a lot of local like San Francisco politicians at this screening as well. And then Chainsaw is shown as a previously unannounced second feature. So they watch this movie, Pel- Taking a Pelham One Two Three, and then all of a sudden you get the beginning of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre next. And they are disgusted by what they saw. There are stories that people walked out. There are stories that people ran out and puked, you know, after seeing this movie. (laughs) And of course, because a lot of the members of this audience were local politicians, this got picked up by the press, which created a lot of controversy and practically free publicity for the film. Uh, So, and, and I'll be honest, I think that that was completely planned by Bryanston, knowing what I know about Bryanston distributors. I think that they're, they, they wanted to drum up controversy around this movie because they knew that it would help the film. Mm. And it was, it did help the film. The film was a smash hit immediately, largely due to a stellar marketing co- campaign from, from Bryanston. I mean, you guys have seen the iconic original poster for this. It is incredible. That tagline, uh, who will be left and what will be left of them. That is a great fucking tagline. Yeah, for it's, a movie. A, yeah it's a good <laughs> it's one. It's really good. Uh, and, and just its first four days of release in Texas alone, the film grossed over $600,000. That's not adjusted for inflation. That's $600,000 in 1974 dollars in wow. Texas alone. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, and then the uh, critics- Joe Bob is like it. adamant that this is the highest grossing film ever made in Texas, like to I this mean, day. That prop may adjusted for inflation. I bet he's absolutely right. Yeah. And then the critics got a hold of the movie and they turned it into a legend. Rex Reed called it the scariest movie I've ever seen, the Jaws of the Midnight movie, which is a pretty amazing quote. Uh, the LA Times, however, called it despicable, ugly, and obscene, a degrading, senseless misuse of film and time. But those bad reviews didn't hurt the movie. <laughs> like that didn't make people not want to see the movie, you know? And then Bryanston stepped it up another notch by gifting a print of the film to the collection of the museum of modern art in New York. <laughs> so they sent them a pristine copy of this. You're going to want then, this. Yeah. And then Bryanston <laughs> started advertising that the film was part of the permanent collection of the museum of modern art, which technically is true because it had been gifted to them and been cataloged. And it was technically part of the Museum of Modern Art. So when the Smart. press would call them and ask if that was true, they'd say, yeah, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, just the beginning of our boy Roger Ebert's review where he just says, like, now here's a grisly little item. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is as violent and gruesome and blood-soaked as the title promises. A real grand gugnol of a move- movie. Did I say that right? Yeah. It's also without any apparent purpose unless the creation of disgust and fright is a purpose. And yet in its own way, the movie is some kind of weird off the wall achievement. I can't imagine why anybody would want to make a movie like this. And yet it's well-made well acted and all too effective. Yeah. Ebert's review is one of those. We, we've talked about Ebert before and how he kind of like just does not like horror movies. It seems. Yeah. And his review of this movie is like, all right, I don't want to admit that this is a good movie, but it's a good movie. You know, that's kind of his thing. Like, I don't like this kind of movie, but they did a good job making this movie. It's like, he doesn't want to admit that it's good. I'd almost rather him just say, I don't like it. You know, I really appreciate that at the beginning, he also seems to fall into, well, we're going to get into this, I'm sure. But uh, just, just the idea of the violent and gruesome and blood soaked and blah, blah, blah. Which is something we'll hit on in a minute, but even yeah. even Ebert's uh, susceptible to this idea. Mm-hmm. And, and and a lot of people, like intellectuals, were kind of pissed off about the whole uh, the MoMA thing, you know. And there was a, especially this one guy, this guy named Stephen Koch, who was he was a friend of Andy Warhol's. 
uh, he had written about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in Harper's. And this, I'm going to read this quote from him, but he says about the film, he says, it is a film with literally nothing to recommend it. Nothing but a hysterically paced slapdash imbecile concoction of cannibalism, voodoo, astrology, sundry hippie-esque cults, and unrelenting sadistic violence as extreme and hideous as a complete lack of imagination can possibly make it. We are here discussing something close to the absolute degradation of the artistic imagination. Andrew Breton said, the simplest surrealist act would be to take a revolver into a crowded street and fire at random. They seem to have read Breton down in Texas. Uh, that sounds a lot like, um, you know, these, these modern day internet reviewers who like to use a lot of big words and sound smart when they don't like a horror movie or, or, <laughs> or an exploitation movie. You know, the, you, have you ever read any of these types of reviews, Gary? Well, it's so weird. Like, I almost feel like I don't have to have because apparently that back in 1974, there were plenty of people that had been working all night writing movie reviews. But uh, yeah, even in this day and age, somebody needs a nap. <laughs> All right, so uh, I got a few of these. We'll run through them here. There, unlike our uh, series on Kill Bill, uh, where everybody who apparently reviewed all of the Japanese film and stuff that we covered uh, loved everything, uh, not everybody loves Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So there were plenty of fun ones. I tried to pick a few here. Uh, this is from Miami says i'm a huge horror fan and as such i feel very strange that this movie is so revered and well oiled because other than being one of the first slasher movies i can't find anything remotely redeemable about this film the first half is so boring that i had to force myself to pay attention and the second half is a noise feel filled annoying mess the only frightening part of this movie was when i realized i still had another shrieking benny hill chasing 30 minutes left I'm still in shock over just how bad this movie was, given the amount of praise for it that there is, in short, ah, chainsaw revving, slow jogging through the bushes, ah! That was the I'd like to say I would like to see someone do an edit of this with Yakety Sax playing in the background the whole time. <laughs> oh, that'd be so great. <laughs> uh, this is from Curi Cur Curiosity Killed Sean. Honestly, I thought this was a joke. I didn't think this was seriously the movie everyone raved about. It's terrible. I mean, it's really, really bad. How on earth anybody could enjoy this film is far beyond my vast, vast, incredibly vast understanding. It's so bad, you can't even laugh at it. First of all, the film's so-called gritty look is plain and simple, the result of the shoddiest photography this side of 70s adult films. The framing is horrifically composed. It makes a drunken wedding video seem like Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> the sound is inaudible. And the dialogue, worthless as it is, is nothing more than mumbles. As the story develops, so does the incomprehension. Midway through, you'll tell yourself, this cannot become any more senseless. Well, it does. By the end, you'll be completely lost, and then it's just over. Just like that. I was assuming there was half an hour left, but it just ends without resolving anything or giving us a payoff. What a ripoff. There is zero suspense. Characters are killed almost right away, leaving no room for excitement. Plus, there is only one massacre with a chainsaw, and you don't even see anything, and it mostly occurs off camera. The final chase with the one character that actually gets some interaction with the bad guy is obviously the best bit of the movie, but by this point, I just wanted it to be over. I have no idea why so many people say this is a great movie or call it horror with a dark comic edge. It's nothing of the sort. It's an embarrassingly amateur schlock fest that Ed Wood himself would disown. Woo. Check out the 2003 remake, which is a zillion times the movie this dreadful nonsense is. <laughs> do, not come with, <laughs> do not come with a mile of this. You have been warmed. TCM is the worst film I've ever seen. It drags on for ages. And to say it's boring, I hate this film. I prefer two and three to this. And I hate those films too. Not recommended. <laughs> but I would recommend the remakes because they are better and scarier. So in my opinion, this is the worst film of all time. No joke. 
the worst film of all time. <laughs> That's what this guy says. <laughs> Oh Ooh. man, wow. that was that was oh a lot. Oh, I always wish I did. That guy's angry. That guy needs a nap. <laughs> he does. Anyway, those are some people that are really hurt by this film. Well, those people, um, I mean, need to get over themselves because uh, this movie is considered a classic. But it, it's considered a classic now. But it was a major success when it came out. This movie was huge. Uh, it, it continued to play in drive-ins and midnight movie houses for years, grossing upwards of uh reportedly you see 30 to 50 million dollars uh as, as what this movie has grossed which in today's dollars would be 265 million dollars for a movie that cost 60 grand so everybody got rich everybody yeah famous. of course of course that's what you th- right everyone got just f- super rich and they're all famous actors now and incredibly successful right, right. that's how this that's how the story that's goes how the right? story ends yeah Now, it turns out that a lot of the actors and crew members had waived their salaries in exchange for a percentage of the movie. Uh, But as deals were made to get the film financed, some of the stuff that Gary went over earlier, like the poker game and things like that, uh, then those percentages went down. So, like, you know, when they signed these deals, okay, they're getting a percentage of the grosses, right? But what what they may or may not have known, and it's, a lot of this blame was put on Toby Hooper at the time, but over the years, it seems pretty clear that he might not have really understood what all was happening. Uh, he's not an accountant; he's an artist. Maybe if he stayed, <laughs> maybe if he'd stayed in film school, he might have. Well, I, some of the they don't teach that in film school. Todd, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just Todd I'm just, bringing the truth. Just a theory. <laughs> just a theory. But so you know, if they're getting, let's say they're getting a a small percent, let's say they're getting of a 0.5%. That's kind of a normal, they're getting points on the film. Well, when they made that deal with Bill Parsley, he owned 50% of the film. So if they're getting a 0.5%, they're really only getting 0.25 because they're getting 0.5 of Vortex's share. Not only that, but once they start selling off shares to like these guys in the poker uh, game and, and various other guys they're all getting partial ownership of the vortex side so that those points for the actors and the crew members are just going down and down and down so after nine months ed neal says it so they're like yeah we're waiting on money we call up toby hooper we're not getting any answers and after nine months i finally get a check and it's 28 dollars. and gunner hansen tells the same story he says forty-seven dollars, but you know, it's well, it is crazy because they're, they're <laughs> seeing they're seeing exactly what the rest of the world's seeing, or what we're talking about here, where this movie starts blowing up. This movie's making a lot of money, a thing. So they're like, "Holy shit, yeah, we've done it!" Like this, this did become the movie. Like this did get released. And uh, what's her name, Terry McKinn? We mentioned earlier. She even tells the story about picking up a hitchhiker randomly with her girlfriend and uh, she they, should have learned from the movie to not yeah that. you would think but she says they pick up the hitchhiker and uh, the guy says like in the car she's she tells the story that like the guy's like thanks so much for picking me up i can't believe you guys did it you would never believe the fucking movie i saw the other night <laughs> and he was like <laughs> the hitchhiker there was a fucking nut job i thought this ruined it for me and he, he said or she says that she was just like you just saw this the other night. Do you recognize me? And he's like, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> just like, freaked out. like, so they all thought, I think they all figured they were about to be superstars. Yeah. And, and box office numbers were not because of the way films were released at this time. They weren't uh, reported uh, the way that they are now, but variety does a little investigative journalism and they report that the film had grossed about $12 million in less than a year, which at the, uh, the way that films were released at this time, that's very good money. But Bryanston, the distributors, their statements show that the movie only made about a million dollars. So how is this possible? Hmm. Well, turns out that the heads of Bryanston were two brothers named Lou and Joe Perano, and they were members of the Colombo crime family. So what they're doing with this movie and other movies is essentially money money yeah yeah 
And they'd gotten into the film business by ex- by extorting the rights of Deep Throat from its director, Gerard Domeno. And we, and we all know how you know, that was, I mean, we haven't talked about it here on the show, but Deep Throat was a major pop cultural moment and a major financial success. Maybe on Patreon, if you want to have a lot of fun, it's me and Todd and Justin <laughs> talking about, talking deep, about throat. deep Throat. Live commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but so that's how they got into the film business because they saw how much money that movie was making and they wanted a piece of it. So they extorted the director and, uh, but they'd since gotten a legitimate reputation by hiring some Hollywood veterans for their West coast office and their West coast office. They're based in, in New York, I believe. Uh, but they had a West coast office, which is kind of where all of the marketing and all of that kind of stuff was done. So after repeatedly requesting an accounting of the film's profits from Bryanston, some of the producers and investors demanded a meeting with the Peranos. So they go to their offices, they walk in, and Lou Perano is in his office, and on either side of him are these two giant, like, stereotypical mafia thugs. These two giant dudes, right, on either side, just <laughs> silent, standing there. The producers are like, we're going to audit the books. To which Perano replied... You ain't going to audit these books. You're not going to audit the books. <laughs> and then when the producers threaten to sue, Prano says, you don't have enough balls to sue me. All the while, these two giant thugs are standing behind them, just silent, just staring them <laughs> down. But they did, so they left, but they did end up suing. And after the case moved through court's time, and again, it ne- nothing ever really came of it, uh, mostly because Bryanson had financed a lot of other movies that made no money or lost a lot of money. So they actually ended up going bankrupt. And then in 1976, the Perino brothers just vanished. Whoa. (laughs) They're gone. (laughs) And they just, they just disappear. Yeah. So the hard part here is just to, to, to clarify is for a guy like Hooper, um, people are looking to him. People are looking to him for the money. People are wondering like, what's up with, you know, hey, this, this movie's pretty successful. I, I'm owed a lot of money. And so uh, Toby, uh, like Justin said, probably didn't have any idea what was going on. I, I would guess. Like, he was not, he was just trying to make his fucking movie. Shit, he's and, not making any money off of it either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's not making any money. So he doesn't know exactly what's happening. But people are hounding him because he's the, he's the director. So like he's he's the guy up here, and uh, for what it's worth, I mean, from everything I can account for, I mean he's in his part kind of ducking it all too, like because probably because yeah. he's scared, doesn't know what's happening, just kind of avoiding it. I'm um, just like I, I have no idea what's going on, so he doesn't want to take calls, he doesn't want to meet with people, he doesn't want to see any of these folks, so it becomes a really weird uh, situation. I guess. I well, it also, and, and we'll get into where his career went after this, but it also didn't help matters that he sort of immediately booked it to Hollywood because yeah. he's still, he's still getting artistic recognition for this. And they felt like he ran off to Hollywood and just kind of abandoned them. But yeah. what, what this all ultimately means is that hardly anyone involved in the making of this movie made any money off of it. And a lot of the cast, you know, they didn't think at the time that they were making anything of artistic merit either at the, at the time. But when you watch this movie now, I think that it's clear that there were some, there's a true artistic vision to this. Like despite what we, we alluded to this earlier, but despite what the cast and many of the crew may have thought during filming, Toby Hooper had a vision. He knew what he was doing. And I do think, like Gary said, I do think the chaotic elements of the shoot contributed to the feeling that you get from the film. And honestly, I think a lot of that was purposely orchestrated by Toby Hooper. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. And and that's that, that's the beauty part of this film. I mean, a lot of the, the things, I mean, we kind of alluded to it with even the Ebert review, but one of the magical things about this movie for better or worse is that what you think you saw, you didn't really see. And, uh, and I think that's pretty brilliant Um, Well, I think that also honestly contributes to the power of the film because, you know, it's the old saying that what you can imagine is worse than what you could be shown. So you're, you're kind of imagining what's going on. And I think psychologically it actually messes with the audience by not seeing 
the details of the deaths, especially like in the, in the meat hook scene, I guess is the most famous one, but the way he shoots that, you know, you see her get lifted, you see her go down, but you don't see it, the meat hook impale her back. And then the camera shows the bucket. You don't even see blood like dripping into the bucket. You just see the bucket and you know what it's there for. Uh, that's sort of brilliant. Yeah, I was listening to a few podcasts, like trying to just go through and see what any modern podcast had done. And there were like arguments, like on a, a couple of the podcasts I heard where they're like, well, the meat hook, hook scene is kind of gory, like it blah, blah, blah. And like one person will be like, no, it's not. Like there's there's not anything there. And they're like, no, well, I remember like just the bloods like coming down and stuff. Like they're like, no, there's there's no blood. So Gary, before we get into it though, I'm listening to you, you know, talk about the kind of artistic merit of the film. And uh, Todd's making faces. I'm, I'm worried that he doesn't agree <laughs> with us about the film's artistic <laughs> merit. Uh, Todd, just before we get into it, let's uh just just give it to us you, what do you, you know think? you know what's coming you know i what's know what's coming. coming and i'm gonna be <laughs> mad about it i'm gonna be upset uh, uh so i you know i i have a feeling i'm gonna fall into the camp of needs a nap um but i'll i'll Damn keep it, i'll keep you son of a bitch <laughs> long and short of it um remember that time you told me you, that you were like a horror guy <laughs> do you remember that and you're taking Gary, the, you, the you one. That, Gary? I do remember that. You guys were going to have a whole thing about it's Todd a horror guy. It's Todd a horror guy. Well, here's the thing. Some of the, I think some of the points made in the reviews of folks that need naps are valid. Fool this man. I mean, you know, any decent narrative has three main things. It's characters, plot, and story. The characters here are either disgusting, annoying, or both, with no with no motivation at all. Um, the plot is aimless at best, and the story is practically non-existent. And I think it's about an hour too long. I'm going to disagree on every one of those points, Todd. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Other than the I fact knew, that I knew, yes, I knew this was going to happen. Annoying. It's you know. Todd, this I, I, felt I, I, I will, I I will felt give bored. you this. I appreciate I, your bravery walking up in this bitch tonight with your bullshit opinion. Bored. This. I it. don't know how anyone could be <laughs> bored with this movie. Uh, I, I, I genuinely don't know how anyone could be bored with this movie. It I'll is. Put, I'll put it to you this way: This is not the first time I've seen this movie. I watched it um, some years ago, and uh, you know, gave it my all. Really, you know, invest. You know sat there paid attention to it had the same thoughts then so when this particular series came up i was like i i have a pretty strong feeling that my thoughts are going to be the same but once again i sat i paid attention sounds like you got an attitude problem <laughs> it just it just, <laughs> didn't, it just didn't strike a chord with me i, I mean I, don't get me wrong Everything that you've been talking about um, behind the scenes is super fascinating. I'd rather watch that documentary than watch this. It's it just hurts my heart, Todd. Uh, yeah, this it, is it, like it's, top three horror movies of all time for me. I don't see how. It's incredible. It's how it is, it is because the, the way what this movie does. So you're you're getting stuck on this idea. Uh, of a of one type of movie when you say okay all movies should have this this and this you're getting stuck on one i'm specific... talking narrative not just movies i'm talking all things okay well, that's fine books, but whatever. but a movie can also invoke a feeling and this movie is a what what toby hooper is doing with this movie is he is creating a a living nightmare scenario uh, Gary mentioned earlier to us that his wife didn't want to watch this movie with him because she doesn't like the way it makes her feel. Uh, not because she doesn't like it, but because she doesn't like the feeling that it invokes. That's powerful. And that's, that's something that very few movies can do. Very few movies can have, make people have a visceral reaction in the way that this movie does. Some movies like can make you just happy watching them. Like this is just my comfort movie or like how the office is for some people is a TV sure. show. Like this is just my, my go-to for like just, chill like something's on you know like this is my easy going one but but that's not what this is this is a movie that's supposed to be like 
let's make you as uncomfortable as possible. Let's make this weird. Let's make this yeah. uh, creepy. I mean, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to feel for these characters as much as just that they are people that are doomed. Like, it's it's the same it's the same formula by the way that most slashers are going to use later on it's right. it's not it's not any different than that i mean literally it's it's everything but like the old man from friday the 13th stepping out to tell you you're all doomed and you're all gonna die like it's it's just i mean these... the cook kind of does that by telling them hey you don't want to go to that old place yeah yeah and it's just i mean it but in my opinion, even more so than like, although I love Friday the 13th and those kind of things, this movie has so many more levels to it uh, as far as what it's capable of achieving as far as the characterization of weirdly, not even just the, the kids. Cause they're, yeah, there's not much with the kids, but it's actually more with the, the family. fucking family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. more about the weird levels of, the weirdos yeah. in this in this movie i absolutely agree i i feel like okay. I, I don't i don't want to say that hooper sympathizes with them but he he creates uh, empathetic characters in them and and hooper has an artistic streak that i mean it's it's clear from the very beginning of the movie because from the onset he is filling the film with little background details that create an atmosphere of dread that just hangs over the entire film. When you when you have this this opening moments, this sound of the flash bulb that that whining sound, and you have these radio reports about raging fires and epidemics, plus news of grave robbing, which is kind of you know the, the thing that sets our our whole story in motion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's creating an atmosphere, and then this stuff is interspersed with imagery of slaughterhouses and rusted junk until finally you settle on this opening shot of this corpse that's been displayed atop of a gravestone. And it's an incredible opening. And you also, you also have to understand just how shocking this film was to audiences at the time. This is four at years before Halloween. At the time. This is four years before Halloween. This is a okay. few months even before Black Christmas, which is kind of considered the proto-slasher. Sure. Uh, the idea of a youth-centered horror film might be cliche now, but at the time it was it was unheard of in mm -hmm. films. Horror films at this time were still generally like in the realm of the gothic. Th things had started to change a few years earlier. Films like Psycho and Rosemary's Baby, and we even talked about it when we talked about Night of the Living Dead. Uh, those films kind of signaled horror's move from the from these like gothic castles into the modern world. But Texas Chainsaw took it a little bit further. Uh, the idea of like these kids that are out on a, on a road trip, you know, and, and then they come across uh, a, a seemingly unmotivated killer. Um, and the, they're, you know, how many times have you seen that story now where out of towners or city, city kids go out into the, the sticks and they're met with hostility from the locals. It's done, I mean, it had been done a very recent to this in deliverance, but in a very different way. At the time, this had never really been done before. And, and, and the other thing is this movie is not really, it's not structured necessarily like a horror film. Uh, there's no buildup to the horror of the film. There's, there, there's this feeling of dread uh, that hangs over the film that tells you that there are bad things coming. And not to mention that ominous voiceover at the beginning by John Larroquette, by the way. Uh, we should we got to point out John Larroquette on this movie. Yeah. I do. I think his voiceover is great, <laughs> and the story behind that is really fun because uh, they they wanted a voiceover guy, and somebody knew John Larroquette, and they, he was a you know out of work actor at the time. And there, Toby Hooper's like, "Can you do like an Orson Welles thing?" And of course, John Larroquette, being an unemployed actor wanting a job, he's like, "Yeah, I can do an Orson Welles thing." And of course, he doesn't really do an Orson Welles thing I, at all. I can also but... ride. I can also ride a horse. It's on my resume. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, it's a great voiceover. But there's no gradual build to Leatherface's appearance. You don't see like you don't see him killing people like in a pre-credit sequence or something like that, like you would in most movies. The dude just, you know, you've got this guy wandering into a house, and then he just appears in a doorway. And fills the doorway, like in the story that Toby Hooper tells about when he met Gunnar Hansen. He appears in this doorway. He smacks a guy in the head with a hammer, drags the body in, and slams the door shut. Like he doesn't, the, the victim doesn't even have a chance to like be scared or even react to Leatherface's appearance before he's like 
twitching on the floor. And it's it's an, one of the best, I think, introductions to a, a horror movie villain of all time. And the fact that it is completely out of nowhere. Like you, yes, you, you know something's coming, but it's not like a jump scare. He just walks out casually like it's his job and just wails this dude in the head with a hammer. Yeah, and, um, I, I would say that that, you know, uh, going back to a thing I, I kind of brought up last time, just uh, the fun part. I, I, I was curious, like uh, best scenes in the movie or whatever. You know, I mentioned that last week. Um, that would have been mine for this one. Although I feel like for most people, the dinner scene is probably going to win that. Um, I'm a big fan I of love the dolly it, shot, the dolly shot that goes under the swing, uh, the following the, them up to the house. Not just because yeah. it's a good sh- shot of her butt. But because right. it's a great, it's a great shot. It's it the really image is. like every site you'll go to, yeah, uses <laughs> because because it shows this looming giant house, and he's using like this blue sky of the Texas, which is normally like what you would consider a beautiful site. He uses it in multiple scenes, but most memorably in that one as kind of a backdrop of horror, you know. Yeah, but for me, the the exact scene you're talking about where dude stumbling into the house just like you don't belong there what are you doing there and like at that time i mean one of the important things is is like i don't think people realize like the dangers that i mean i guess like people thought about that stuff but it wasn't like as prescient as it is well, now people like you're scared of hitchhikers and, yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly you're not as, as scared of all of these things and then all of a sudden this dude like stumbles into this house and then a fucking door opens a freak of nature masked man walks out just like boom, hammers on the head, drags him out as his body's like shaking. And it's just like, like you said, like it's his job. And it's just like, I don't know. The more I see that scene, the more it like hits me on different levels. And one of like the initial shock for the first time I ever saw it to like the slasher film side of things to like the, wow, it could really just be that fast and meaningless. Like it's just like wax yeah. you and takes you and you're done. That's it. That's kind of freaky to me. <laughs> like it's just, yeah. This time around, that was it for me. It's just like, God, the dude's, that whole fucking dude is just, everything's over. That yeah. character is no more, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, yeah. it's just, I don't know. This is kind of weird. Just boom, out like a light. I, I love that part of it, just like the, but, but going back to what I was saying before, too, you don't get times where, uh, you know, you, you could say this for like maybe Michael Myers, but used in a totally different way you don't get times where you're hanging out with the killer so much, except yeah. when they're enacting terror on somebody. Michael Myers, you get sometimes, but it's mostly in the like creepy stalking moment. And and that could work for Michael Myers in his own way, just in the sure. fact that that's all he is. But like with a guy like Leatherface, uh, for instance, or with this family. Well, you see that moment with Leatherface where he's like sitting by the window and he looks like freaked out kind of, you know, like he's sitting by the window and has his head, his hands on his head. And like, he seems like he is scared, honestly. Yeah, you know? exactly. And uh, so, yeah, you don't get that out of a Jason or a Freddy usually or anything. There's not like this extra layer of these things or even witnessing like the inside of the house with these people, uh, with the weird morality of the old man being like, don't you have pride in your house? Why would you tear yeah. up the door? Come on. And uh, they're formally gathering for dinner. And, but then that takes you into the all different levels of what could Toby Hooper be saying with this movie, which is really right. interesting. And I think people like probably are blowing some of it out of proportion. Like maybe he was just, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Maybe this guy well, yeah, was really to, on the um, level of, well, there was, I mean, this was a fucked up time in America. There were, there was a gas crisis that, and which plays into the plot of this film because the reason they have to stay around is because there's no gas at the gas station. Uh, there was a Watergate. There was Vietnam. Like there was the, the, the feeling, the overall feeling in America at that time was one of, of dread. Sounds familiar. <laughs> but that's kind of, I think, what, Toby Hooper is responding to it is like he's he's kind of creating this feeling of dread over this entire film he's portraying the America as he saw it to yeah. an extent 
and maybe he's trying to do it like like we talked about earlier. Maybe he's trying to do it in this PG way or something. Like he's really hoping he can nail it. Um, but it's uh, for me always the the biggest part of this movie is gonna be like later on just how I felt and and props where it's due. You know, I totally disagree with anybody who thinks the remake is better than this one, but I think the remake does create a sense of dread. It tries. It tries really yeah, yeah, hard. it's a completely yeah. different type of movie. It's going for something different. I think the remake's fine. I think it's, I mean, I think it's pretty good as far as remakes of these movies go, uh, but definitely not better, I think, than this because this movie is so unique and like, and, and part of what makes it work so well is that it's not, it's narrative. So, just, I mean, just throw that out. That's not what's important in this film because that's not, there's there's enough narrative to move the story along, right? So I, I know that's something that Todd, that you mentioned, but that's not what they're trying to do here. In, in a sense, like when you talk about art house movies, I mean, in a sense, that's what he's doing here too. He's more focused on the, the feeling than he yeah. is an actual like broad story or anything. Exactly. Like that. It, so I, I think what really sticks with you in this movie is that feeling and these hallucinatory visuals that are created by, uh, by Daniel Pearl, uh, who's doing, I think, incredible work and the editing, which is incredible in this movie, the editing in this movie, like it is movies, what 80 minutes long. And I think there's 800 and something cuts in the entire film. Like it's, it's edited like, immaculately i mean he he was prescient enough he he fucking saw the blair witch before the blair witch was a thing like he (laughs) he he got exactly what he was looking for in that based on a true story documentary style with the john larroquette narration at the beginning Mm -hmm. like just the way it's shot the edits the cuts it's not like shaky cam or anything like that but it's like uh, yeah i mean there are dolly shots in it yeah, but it's which just they had still... to do, by the way, they only had like 14 feet of dolly, so they would have to like roll the camera on the dolly, and then crew members would take back pieces of the dolly and run up and at them so that they could get those longer dolly shots. Yeah, but there were people, uh, for me, the most powerful thing of this movie always is going to be that feeling like what it should invoke, like what. And yeah. I know, I, I guess, Todd, you didn't get it, but like, uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean, like, I guess you didn't feel the same way I did. But for some reason, this movie always, for me, just feels like, I don't know, like, like a fucking I nightmare. Watch Friday it feels the 13th. Like a, and I'm like, yeah. this is a fun movie. Like, the Friday right. 13th movies are fun. And uh, with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's never like a feel good slasher movie. It's just like, uh, this is miserable. Like, these. It's kids dark are, and fucked. unrelentingly bleak. And I, I think. The visuals are a big part of that. I think the sound design is a huge part of that. There's no score to this movie. It's just yeah, no actual music. The sound, sound design though is it is and that incredible. fucking weird and, sound that uh, I forget who made it now, but like he took it to his grave. I don't think anybody knows how to make that sound exactly. That whining sound. Yeah, it's yeah. just a sound they just reuse. That wing. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just uh, it's 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 weird. I I, I think one of the legacies of it is going to be how it's supposed to make you feel and yeah. makes because, you and think it, you see what you didn't see. Like uh, yeah. people like Joe Bob and Gunnar Hansen and Toby Hooper up until his death and stuff. They'll tell you like, even at conventions, like people will come up to you and tell you, um, well, at the time people thought this was a snuff film. There were, there were like legitimate film critics that thought this was a snuff film. Like they had actually done something. And, yeah. uh, but there would be people who would claim like, Oh, I have relatives who know who the real leather face. Is. Yeah. Or, no, it's based yeah. on a true story. Yeah. Leather, that leather face is in this New Jersey prison, like up right. where I'm from, <laughs> like he's there. They would tell you these stories about the real leather face. And then people would be like, I don't like this movie. It's too gory. Like, ah, it's too much. And there's for no me. gore. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, uh, I, I think it's just cause the, uh, that feeling of dread, that feeling, uh, that, that nightmare feeling that Toby Hooper created for the film just hits people in a, in an area of their brain that most movies don't. It's, there's a visceral element to this film that you don't get from most films. There's a texture to this film, both, vi- both visually and, and, uh, orally like it's there's just something about it that hits different you know 
there was a uh todd and i'm sorry i feel like i'm like walking all over you here too but uh i don't feel like there's really anything i can say that you guys are gonna shoot down so <laughs> i mean well hey you're you're part of the conversation you're you know we'll give you we'll give you a clearly you're us. not alone there were people on imdb <laughs> and amazon who agreed but uh you know guillermo del toro cites this movie as one of the reasons he went like vegetarian which feels yeah. extreme for me like i i still like a burger but well, toby toby hooper went vegetarian while making the movie Oh really? And, yeah, uh, he did. Probably maybe because he was hanging out with rotting meat all day. Uh, N- Nicholas Winding Refn, the director of Drive, has also said this is the this movie is the reason he makes movies. I was gonna, interestingly enough, Justin, unplanned. I was about to say I have a quote here from Nicholas Winding Refn, and uh, he says, "When I was fourteen, I saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I saw that film was an art form, meaning that I saw subliminal images." That's when I realized the power of art. It's not what you see. It's what you think you see. That's when it penetrates the audience. That's when it goes deep. On the surface, you watch like a brain and you understand, but with the subliminal images or the thought of subliminal images, that's when it's penetrated and the art has taken your body. I love that. (laughs) He says penetrate a lot. I love love that. I love that too. I love that too. I'm not sure that that applies to this movie, but. Okay. Well, hey different, guys, okay, let me just let me just ask. So they so they pull up to a gas station and they're having trouble getting gas. They're not able to get the gas, whatever. The house they're going to is like a hundred yards away. What's your point? And then the and then the next house <laughs> what, what, so I'm struggling to because I mean she runs there. With no problem at all, like, but they're making this gas thing to be, and again, I'm not sure why they're going to the house. It's burned out. Like, they're going to the house because there's their family's old house. Yeah, and there's and then there's a gas generator there. So they're Frank going just, looking for gas. No, the Frank gas, just gen- really the gas wants... generator is at another house. Is that, yeah. the, is that the family's house? Well, that's is true. That the... By the way, I think that's oh, super yeah, yeah. creepy I thought that's because the house you think this about. movie's Sorry. called Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the generator kind of sounds like a chainsaw. So I always like that eerie feeling of that too. But besides that, no, they're going to the house because they need to refill for them to make the rest of the trek to where they're going, but they don't know that they'll have enough gas to get there. Refill it's, them. Uh, on gas? On gas. At the house that's burned out? No. The gas station is about 100 yards away from the house they're going to, like you just said. Okay. So the guy tells them, we don't have any gas right now. So you can't get gas. The gas truck is going to be here later on. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, while we're waiting, let's go down here to this other house. This is our old family house. Okay, because I thought that's where they were headed in the first place. No, they were going to the grave site of the grandfather, which they go to at the yeah. beginning. Yeah, like okay. Because right, they're they're right. trying because there's reports of grave robbing and they're going to see if grandpa's grave has been desecrated. Okay. All right. That's, and then they get okay, to the gas station, they're making now. their way back. They're trying to get back, and they're like, We don't have enough gas to get there. So they're at the gas station, and the guy's like there's no gas right now. There should be a gas truck coming through. So you just have to wait. You want some barbecue, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all right. All right. Get out. And there, Franklin's like, oh, well, our old house is up this way. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he's like, old house is up this way. Come on, let's go up here. You know, that gas station is an actual barbecue restaurant now. Now really? it is. It's awesome. Yeah. And the house, the farmhouse got moved. It's not there anymore, but it's a restaurant too. So you can go. You know, have dinner in the in the Sally. <laughs> Sally. But, well, let, let's take so the finale of this film, and this is part of what I, I think makes this a special film. And Gary has uh, kind of discussed this a little bit, but the finale of this film, where Sally sits, she's been taken hostage or taken, she's been captured. She sits this sort this sort of fucked up version of the Alice in Wonderland tea party. Uh, right. because sure. and this and they're they're actually is sort of in a, a lot of parallels with Alice in Wonderland if you think about it like she is you know this outsider who is in this nightmare world and then yeah this is her version of the mad tea party uh i think it's one of the most disturbing scenes in a horror movie the family looks like some sort of like parody of a typical family sitcom you've got 
the cook in the role of like the father figure. You've got Leatherface in a wig as the mom. Uh, we don't know what happens to the actual mom. And then the hitchhiker is like kind of the teenage son who's acting out all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And then of course you've got grandpa who uh, is like, I think he's supposed to be like 108 years old. In this. We think he's dead until he starts sucking on that finger. Or something. Yeah. yeah, and he uh, and he can barely hold this hammer that he used to use as a tool to kill cattle, right? And and the family that family is what makes this so interesting uh, to me because they are sympathetic in a way that's rare in a horror film for a horror villain. Uh, Leatherface is yes, he's terrifying, but he's also clearly mentally handicapped and seems to be bullied by his two older brothers. He seems to be scared of them. Like they they are kind of fussing at him about cooking dinner in that scene. And th the family themselves are also kind of relatable. Like the, these are country folk who've been abandoned by the modern world. They've lost their job to automation. And that's another part of, I think, what Toby Hooper is trying to say with the film is that it's this encroachment of technology taking people's livelihoods away people are being left behind which is again still a modern concern among a lot of people especially in rural areas we've seen a lot of strife uh in recent years that has been spawned from that very feeling not to and, mention that both these guys especially hinkle like i said he found it easier to be a redneck than a hippie but yet yeah. they still ended up making their counterculture movie like with the old folks like the the old white, I mean, I've seen the reviews go so far as, you know, the old white patriarchy, you know, like that they were attacking this, even at this time, like just yeah. these people that think their old ways are better. And then they're just stuck in these, the way they are, you know, yeah. and that they're really. There's the, also the fact that Texans don't want people coming on their property. You know, there you go. So that's another. Uh... What's well, true. I mean, it's, it's, it's still a weird thing. I still like, there's a part of me that feels a little bit for Leatherface. I mean, I don't think you should just randomly kill people, but at the same yeah, time, if, I'm so, like, I mean, listen, here's the thing though. If I'm at home and somebody you're just, just like wandered, sitting around watching TV or jerking off on the internet out, and you're like, somebody wanders into my house. <laughs> I might, I might hit them with a hammer. <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if, if somebody I don't know just wanders into my house randomly uh, yeah, I'm going to get a little aggressive. He's a simpler his... man, and these are simpler times. <laughs> this is He's like, why the fuck do people keep walking in my goddamn house? Yeah. Come on, man. And then the final scene. I'm just I trying mean, to make a titty couch over it, here, and you just fucking <laughs> stroll in my living room. <laughs> if you And if you think about the, the way that this movie does influence later slasher films, this is, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, this is kind of the first mask I'm, th I'm sorry this is the first youth oriented horror movie mm -hmm. where the teenagers are the victims you know yeah it's also the first american horror film with a masked killer uh some there was some giallo stuff that was out before this uh so you can see that as part of that dna as well but this is the reason movies like th this is the reason that jason and michael myers wear masks Mm. uh sally is the the very first final girl like that that final scene where it's a it's a she's the only one left and leatherface is chasing her through the woods which is an, an, a great chase sequence and i think uh i think joe bob even said it i think marilyn burns is one of the best screamers in horror movie history uh she does nothing but scream for the last 20 minutes of this movie and it becomes like that sound of the chainsaw like just this droning sound that I again I think is fully intentional on Hooper's part to make it so annoying. Uh, pronounced. Oh, All right. shut up, Todd. <laughs> well, well, and, and it's at a point you're like, all right. I mean, I get it. She's terrified, but it's just. Oh, I mean, did your I, wife watch this clearly one? Clearly, this was not meant for me. Did your wife you're not watch a horror it? guy. Oh God. <laughs> did Cat watch it? She did. What she think? She um. <laughs> I she I, I think she would agree with me. Mm. Um she she was not into it. She's not into she's not into a lot of films we cover, honestly. <laughs> it was like my wife's not her. either. I mean, but my wife, you know, she was she was she knows this one pretty well. Yeah. yeah. She just uh yeah, she but but she straight up says like she she's a more of a fun loving movie person, and this is not a fun loving movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean Bunny, my 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 wife 
would she prefers fun horror movies i think return of the living dead i think she would call her favorite oh, horror movie yeah, yeah, yeah um but she likes this movie uh, she did not watch it with me this time because she was at work and i sometimes i'll wait for her so that we can watch them together because she likes to watch the stuff that we're doing on the podcast but she's like i've already seen it so many times just go ahead yeah. i mean we've got a texas chainsaw massacre poster framed in our living room yeah so <laughs> you know, <laughs> So you can say we're we're fans, you know. Yeah, and yeah. I, and, and I get you know, it after a little while. I mean, there's certain parts of the movie that will lose its edge. Like my favorite scene being the guy, but like Leatherface, the first time you see him. I mean, I saw some review somewhere. Forgive me for not quoting you if you're listening, and I know you are. Um, <laughs> the uh, the person was describing like there's only so many times that you could see the alien pop out of the chest or Leatherface pop yeah. through the door that it like loses a little bit of its edge like it's not sure. the same feeling anymore it's not the same on multiple viewings but that doesn't mean it's not effective right right and yeah. so and, uh, and again i think we discussed sort of the structure of of this show and why the chemistry of the three of us i feel works really well is because you guys dive dive deep and i take that surface level reaction nobody I'm watching, here I'm watching has the said movie that you're bullshit todd is. I mean, I may I may have said that. I, I don't say, really. I'm mean definitely it. sure you said I was bullshit, Gary. I've definitely <laughs> thought it. I mean, I don't know if I've said it out loud, but it has crossed my mind that Todd. But is but we have a relationship that you know I I really still like you as a person. Like I mean, we're still <laughs> we're still the best of friends. I just hate that you feel this way about this movie because I love it so much. Well, it's I mean, you know, and, and when taking, I say I'm taking the movie as it is on screen with nothing else, n- no other research or reading or consideration for the time or you know i re- i rarely even pay attention to the opening credits of who's in it like i want to experience this on screen as it is pure and to be fair and that's probably that's, something we we should all have like i mean that or, or i mean like we should have on this show because like justin does like at, at length like detailed research i well and and i mean in. It depends on the movie too. Like if it's a movie that I've not seen before or I haven't seen in a long time, you know, I always watch the movie before doing any research. Next so week's movie I've never seen. So I'm going to watch it one time. Next just, week's movie I've never seen. So, so I'm going to watch it just as, as is. And I, and I always <laughs> watch the movie before doing research because I don't want the research to necessarily uh, color my viewing of the hmm. film. Although this is a movie that, I already know quite a bit about because I've seen this movie 20 times probably. Sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, this I mean, is I, when I, I when I, when I said it was one, like a top three horror movie for me, I was not exaggerating. My top three horror movies would be the shining John Carpenter's the thing. And then this movie, and Sorry, I Gary, am, but this, but I this am comes no, up, this comes above Halloween for me. I sort of hate that, but <laughs> I, uh, just, just by one slot though, just by one slot. <laughs> I um, would be number four. I was just going to establish <laughs> that I'm no Toby Hooper dick sucker, especially now that he's not around anywhere. That'd be awkward, That'd be but messy. Um, but because I just watched, you know, I just watched eggshells on YouTube. I didn't even get through the whole thing. I I'll throw this out there. My wife, I know when we watch poltergeist is going to want to watch that one again. She loves poltergeist. I don't care about poltergeist. Like, I think it's fine. Like, I think it's okay. Like, whatever. But I never, I've never thought it was a great movie. So I guess I'm just establishing up front that we'll probably run into these things. Well, Well, this is going to be, I think, Texas Chainsaw is legitimately like one of the best movies. I think this is going to be similar to when we discussed Romero, where there are going to be some gems that we maybe have not seen before. And there are going to be others that we watch and we're like, all right monkey shines wasn't great <laughs> <You> know, <right? laughs> so, but th- that's the journey that we're taking with this filmmaker series and that's why we do this because it's fun i think mm-hmm. to see the evolution of a filmmaker and to see you know by di- diving into their career to see what may have caused that like monkey shines was not great not necessarily because of romero's because you know it was a studio film and he had his hands tied in a lot of aspects but uh, and and we'll see some very interesting developments in Toby Hooper's career as we go forward. Of course, well, based on uh, based on what the information that you've given, like I said, it makes me want to go watch documentaries about the making of this movie. It makes me want to, you know, it makes me excited for 
the rest of this series hearing yeah. you know what he went through and all the I think, all the different twists and turns of the pro of the production and the behind the scenes. I think the important yeah, thing to take away about Toby Hooper from the production of this movie is that one, we know that his original intention was not to be a horror f- filmmaker, even though he loved horror movies as a kid, loved horror movies, loved horror comics, big horror fan. Uh, but he wanted to make art movies. He wanted and and he approaches his horror films a lot of times in that mindset of the first thing I think that he wants to convey to an audience is a feeling more than anything else. In, Isn't in this always film. the way as Toby Hooper wants to make art films. John Carpenter wants to make Westerns. Wes Craven right. wanted to make porn. Um, no, Wes Craven <laughs> did make porn. <laughs> <laughs> Wes Craven, he, he accomplished that goal. Uh, so, uh, this is the point in the show as we begin to wrap up that I want to get to our segment called Fur Viewing. So you guys, I don't know if you guys have anything. I, uh, I've i got a couple though. The first one, of course, The Hills Have Eyes, I have to mention, speaking of Wes Craven, just because I feel like it has that same feeling as this movie and also because they reuse a lot of the same props from Bob Burns's collection. Um, another one that I would mention is Wrong Turn and especially Wrong Turn 2. Because I think it's another another series about kind of backwoods killers. And I think those movies are, the first two at least, are good. And the second one, I think, is actually pretty damn great. Of course, we mentioned the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake uh, by Nar- Marcus Nispel. It's one of those uh, Platinum Dunes remakes. There's a lot of bad ones. Uh, but that mm-hmm. one is really good, I think. Me and Gary yeah. will argue about the Friday the 13th remake. And then you can't talk about Texas Chainsaw and talk about other movies that maybe would would pair well with it without mentioning House of a Thousand Corpses. Straight off the uh, Texas uh, it Chainsaw is, Massacre. Oh, it is absolutely. I mean, and and you know, I mentioned that this movie's got some parallels with Alice in Wonderland. Rob Zombie found those parallels and he fucking ran with them. <laughs> in House of a Thousand Corpses, it's about a fucked up family, uh, and it hell, it even stars a guy who will get really get his start in the horror business thanks to toby hooper a few years down the line mr uh, and there's even a musical number in house of thousand corpses it's, yeah it's <laughs> fucking wild uh, i happen to really like house of a thousand corpses i know a lot of people are hit or miss on rob zombie and i hell i'm hit or miss on rob zombie but i i like house of a thousand corpses i love devil's uh, rejects well we'll have to do rob zombie someday because i think i'm only hit with him for the most part so uh, I'm mo- i am mostly hit with him yeah, but uh, ha- Halloween is probably my least favorite of his. Yeah, well, and there's that argument that that you know, there's a whole. Ar- well, it, it, this is this isn't about that. Uh, <laughs> Do you only, guys have any further viewing though? I was gonna say the only other fur- further viewing is I would say like you could have some fun if you're curious. Uh, obviously, we're gonna hit on Texas Chainsaw two at some point, so uh, we're that that's obviously a recommendation and i I would say texas chainsaw massacre the next generation i know that sounds crazy but i just is that the matthew mcconaughey one it is and renee zellweger and it's it's unfairly maligned i think actually that movie i just watched it in october and it's pretty fun like it's it's not as bad as you're led to believe like everybody treats it like this can you believe renee zellweger and matthew mcconaughey were in this awful bullshit horror movie and if you go back and watch it now it's like it's it's all right like it's especially compared to a lot of the bullshit that comes out these days so yeah yeah uh, i don't know since todd didn't like this movie i don't know that he would have any further viewing um further viewing I he's like rec- any just watch anything else i, would, re- <laughs> I was literally <laughs> gonna say i would recommend anything else uh, <laughs> fool this man <laughs> watch what we're gonna watch next week how about that <laughs> anyway well so after this movie, a lot of the cast would not continue to really act. Marilyn Burns would appear in Hooper's next film, the movie we're talking about next week, but then basically retired from acting. Uh, she became, I think she started selling like mobile phones in Texas or something. Uh, Hanson appeared in a couple more films before retreating to the world of academia. He would later kind of come out of acting retirement. Um, he started teaching, you know, he started teaching, but he would later go on to do, he did like, I think he's in Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers. And then 
nothing else after that but then in later in life he started doing cameos and movies and things and doing the horror movie circuit and all that but continuing to teach and continuing to write the whole time most of the cast didn't even keep texas chainsaw massacre on their resumes uh but hooper and hinkle you know when this came out they were hot shit because they were the guys who wrote and directed this movie and the film led to them getting a three picture deal with universal pictures uh, they were on a salary with universal and they were basically getting paid to develop and write three movies they had offices on the same studio backlot as directors like william friedkin uh, hot off the exorcist and steven spielberg hot off of jaws two of the biggest directors in hollywood were like their office mates and friedkin who was actually a big fan of chainsaw he was actually instrumental in getting them the deal with universal uh, but before they could work on any of the films for universal they had to satisfy a deal made before their universal contract uh it actually with a with a distribution company owned by roger corman and that film would be their official follow-up to the texas chainsaw massacre released in 1976 called eaten alive and that's the movie we're talking about next week here on the show as we continue our deep dive into the career of Mr. Toby Hooper. Mm. I've never seen Eaten Alive. I'm excited about it. Yep, that's that's going to be a new one for me. Of course, I guess that's not a surprise. All three of us, it's going to be a new one for, so that's exciting. Um, We're going to spend a lot more time with Toby Hooper, so I just want to take a special moment, if we can, just as a uh, show, just to recognize uh, Gunnar Hansen. Like, uh, clearly the first... I mean, literally, I, he, he created an iconic person in Leatherface. Leatherface oh, is yeah. going to be reused forever. So, and honestly, I don't know, his, I, his performance is a big part of why that character is so iconic, I think, because he doesn't play him as just a mindless guy. You know, he plays him as a real person behind that mask, even though you never see his face. He, he's a real, he's a real person. He had a quote. Uh, he said, I never thought I had it in me just before pro- production started. I was sitting in a drugstore, uh, had nothing planned for the summer, heard about a casting call, decided to try out on a lark. I was 26 years old, just out of graduate school. I met Toby Hooper and writer Kim Hinkle, and they asked me three questions before they hired me. Are you a violent person? No. Are you crazy? Not more than normal. They finally asked, can you do it? And I said, sure, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> they love the fact that I filled the doorway. Toby Hooper said, I think we're going to put high heels on you and make you a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> and uh, he says, I'm not even actually totally enamored with this film. It's very, very good at what it is. A film that succeeds in really scaring the hell out of people. As to Chainsaw being analogous to the breakdown of the American nuclear family and other lofty themes recently explored. I don't know. The movie was very effective because we broke rules. A lot like Psycho did when the heroine is killed early in the film. There are no safe scenes in our film. No cuts or distractions that relieve the terror. Um, He just became a favorite. Among aficionados, like uh, Gunnar Hansen became a, a huge icon in horror movies, probably making most of his life just on convention scenes and that sort of thing. But uh, he uh, sadly uh, died of pa- pancreatic cancer, uh, which is... Horrible. Yeah, he passed away in uh, 2015, and he had moved back to Maine which is where he'd spent some of his childhood when he first moved to America. But he, uh, his final role that he filmed was actually in Texas Chainsaw 3D. Uh, that was his final, his final uh, appearance. Uh, not, there was another film that came out after he died that he had uh, appeared in a small role, a movie that he had actually written uh, called Death House. But the final role, his official final role was Texas Chainsaw 3D, which is in 2013. Yeah, he died a couple of years later in Maine, where he had moved back and, and had continued to write for most of his life. Uh, 68 years old when he died. Yeah. Just a sad, sad story. And, uh, but Speaking I just had Bob, Bob Burns uh, was another, um, a, a, a lot of people involved in this movie have since died. Marilyn Burns has passed away, passed away of a heart attack a few years ago uh, in her sleep. Uh, Bob Burns uh, committed suicide after being diagnosed with uh, un, un uh, I guess, uncurable cancer. He had cancer and he just 
decided to take his own life, unfortunately, a few years ago. Uh, so a lot of people involved in this movie have died, but this movie lives on, you know, the movie is, you know, Toby Hooper had a quote where he's like, man, I didn't know that the movie we were making would be spoke about in the same way that people talk about gone with the wind, like a movie that is an iconic piece of film history. But this is the, this is what we did. It's like, I we were a bunch of kids, I, a bunch of, he, he was 29 years old. I think when he directed the movie. I you venture know. to guess that uh, more podcasts have been made covering this movie than covering Gone with the Wind. So he's oh, right yeah. on target. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there's obviously more to tell about Toby Hooper and his whole experience in Hollywood. And I'm excited to get delve into that. Just wanted to mention Gunnar Hansen because as a huge horror nerd, uh, I just I feel like uh, until Valhalla, Gunnar, Han- Gunnar Hansen, because you're the... I, I mean, the legendary, the first mass serial killer in horror movies, like the yeah. the the guy. So, uh, you know, and I say that as a huge Michael Myers fan, Gunnar Hansen as Leatherface was the OG, and people have been trying to mimic that ever since. So, uh, Gunnar, Gunnar Hansen, Leatherface walked so that Michael Myers could also walk very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> creep behind shadows uh yeah i the wife asked me the other day on like uh horror villain battles who would win michael myers or leatherface and i was like michael myers <laughs> like i was like just easily like i love leatherface but leatherface doesn't have strategy and michael myers employs that he is a cat chasing a toy constantly <laughs> but leatherface yeah. is just like <laughs> a bull in a china shop just like running through places yeah. like mainly <laughs> not even shot running through a china face. shot it, it, china shop he's he's just kind of just trying to be like fucking leave me alone like yeah. i'm just just don't fuck with me like I just want to make some sausage yeah i'm just trying to cut some people up man I'm trying to make <laughs> good food for you people to eat so the old man can win barbecue contests but that's in texas chainsaw too yeah yeah we'll get to that later so uh for now we'll wrap this episode up thanks for joining us for this series this is going to be a really fun one i think uh it's going to go to some weird places because toby hooper has an incredibly interesting career i think uh so we'll be back next week for eating alive if you want to find out where to stream that uh you can go to cinemashock.net we'll have a link there if you find the description of this episode the texas chainsaw episode i've always got links on those descriptions where you can find where to stream the next couple of films that we're going to talk about. So you'll also got to get a sneak preview of what movies we're going to be talking about in the upcoming weeks. If you check that out, Uh, you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at cinema underscore shock, find us on Facebook and like us and, you know, rate and review on pod, uh, all the podcast apps and all that stuff. Uh, Todd's got his uh, star Trek show is out. Now episode one has dropped Uh, maybe episode two by time uh, this episode comes out. So uh, you can find uh, the Computer Resume podcast on Podbean today, hopefully. So yeah, we're, yeah, soon. We, yeah, we're working on getting it other places. Yeah. And, uh, of course, Gary's got his This Is Pro Wrestling podcast everywhere. You can find that on YouTube and all the podcast places. I slipped my wrestling reference in this episode. Todd didn't uh Star Trek of a uh, reference. I, yeah, I, uh, yeah I, I figured I'd <laughs> take a back seat on this one. <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't even know where it would have fit but anyway yeah where can you get back guys be found on the internet at this is gary horn on all the things at mr todd a davis on all the things and i am at justin underscore bishop and until next week may the wings of liberty never lose a feather be excellent to each other johnny has the keys oh wow we don't get like an embellishment this time uh well i mean i i thought about I don't know. I thought about trying to do it like as a uh, Franklin, you know, with a Franklin accent. It, I, I, it was just so grating. Sally, Johnny yeah. has the keys. <laughs> Franklin, Fucking Franklin. I'm glad he, I'm glad that piece of shit died. Uh, <laughs> <so> <laughs>